Hi, good morning and welcome to the Delta Stewardship Council meeting. It's Thursday, June 27th, 2024 at 9.30 a.m. We are here at the California Natural Resources Building at 715 P Street in Sacramento. My name is Julie Lee and I'm the chair of the Delta Stewardship Council. Before we begin today's meeting, I wanted to let everyone know that there's a small change to the agenda. Item 6B, the legislative update, will take place at the end of today's meeting after agenda item 9, the Delta conveyance update. Um, and then we're going to have Emma explain how the public can participate in this meeting. Emma? If any member of the public is interested in providing public comment on any agenda item during today's meeting, please send an email blue card to engage at deltacouncil.ca.gov as seen on the screen. Be sure to note your name and the agenda item that you wish to speak on. When called, the clerk will unmute you. Thank you. And we're going to do our roll call and establish a quorum. In accordance with our Begley Keen requirements, we'll conduct a roll call of in-person council members first. Um, Emma, can you lead us in a roll call? Councilmember Burgess. Here. Councilmember Demrell. Councilmember Wiso. Here. Councilmember Moranian. Here. Chair Lee. Here. And for our remote council members, please disclose if there are other individuals over the age of 18 with you and a brief description of their relationship to you. Also, please remain on camera for the duration of this meeting if possible. Emma, can you lead us in a roll call of the remote council members? Vice Chair Miller. Uh, here, and I'm in Madrid, Spain with other folks from the Brickfield Company. Councilmember Zingali. I'm here in Eureka, and there are no other humans present, just a lot of chickens. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> All right, so we have a, definitely got a quorum. Everybody is here. Um, the next item is public comment. This is an item for the public to comment on any topic which is not on our agenda. Uh, any comments on items on the agenda need to be taken during that item. Emma, do we have any public comments for items not on today's agenda? We do not, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, our next item for is our consent calendar, and we have one item on the consent calendar, which is the adoption of the May 23rd, 2024 meeting summary. Um, I'll ask the members if there's any need for discussion on that item. Move approval. All right. I'll second that. Seeing none, uh, we'll entertain a motion. So a motion made by Member Moranian and seconded by Member Burgess. And we will proceed with the roll call vote, Emma. Um, before we do roll call vote, I want to note that there are no public comments. Oh, thank you. All right. Council Member Burgess. Yes. Council Member Demrell. Councilmember Weso. Yes. Councilmember Moranian. Yes. Vice Chair Miller. Aye. Councilmember Zingali. Yes. Chair Lee. Yes. All right, the motion passes. Our next item is the chair's report. This is uh, my turn to talk to you. And I had one thing that I wanted to highlight, which was the Delta Research Awards Seminar Series, which is taking place right now on Wednesdays at 1030. Um, I've uh, been able to attend several of these and they are very interesting. Um, this year they're doing a weekly seminar series with recipients of the 2020 Delta, Delta Research Awards and they're sharing how their findings can inform water and environmental decision making in the Delta. Um, so this is a way for us to kind of close the circle on the awards that we give out in our grants program. And it's great to have the scientists actually come back and talk to us about what their research has, has uh, produced. Um, and so it, it's at 1030 and it's good to get there at 1030 and listen to the whole thing because at the end you can actually ask the scientists questions if you have any. Um, or if you don't have time to do it at 1030, uh, these are also available on our YouTube channel, which is probably linked on our website someplace. Um, but they're, they're really wonderful. Um, 
Each one uh, has a topic, um, kind of a theme for the seminar. And then there's usually a, a couple of um, research awards related to that theme. So it's anything from um, social and historical perspectives to wetland carbon to uh, information about salmon and sturgeon and uh, harmful alg algal blooms. Um, so it's kind of uh, all different types of topics for anyone that might be interested. So I'll just encourage folks to um, support that. Uh, I think that they've had a pretty good response so far from what I've been able to tell. Um, so that's been kind of wonderful. Um, they have a series of meet and greets scheduled in June and July that the ledge folks have been working on. So I'll be able to talk more about that in July. Um, and it is summer vacation season. Um, I just got back from a short trip with my daughter in Nashville. I was just telling folks about it. And unbeknownst to us, it was uh, Pride weekend. And so we had an extra super fun time. Um, we're wrapping up Pride Month. So I just wanted to acknowledge that for everybody and say that even in the South, they did some wonderful things for Pride. So it was great to see. Um, and then I think we've got some vacations coming up with some members off and on. So. Um, We'll just be very flexible during the summer and remember to take your leave and go on vacation. It's important for your mental health. <laughs> All right, so that's my report. Does any members have anything they wanted to add, chime in? Go ahead, Member Burgess. Uh, as you were talking, I just wanted to acknowledge the city of Oakley celebrating their 25 year anniversary of being a city, one of our Delta there, cities. Okay, so yeah. awesome. Cool, all right. Any remote folks, anything else that I missed from anybody? No, okay. Uh, so uh, we, oh, is there any public comment on this item? Uh, no, Madam Chair, there is not. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, we will move on to the executive officer's report and I'll turn it over to Jessica Pearson. Good morning, thank you, Chair. Um, I'll open with a brief plug for an upcoming event. Uh, we have the Council's second Science for Communities workshop, which is going to take place on Friday, July 12th. It's going to be held between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. at the San Joaquin Delta College in Stockton. Science for Communities builds partnerships between scientists, community-based organizations, and members of the public. Through this effort, uh, Council staff aim to connect community-based organization members and tribes with agency and academic science partners to address social environmental issues that impact communities in the Delta. The goal of the workshop is to create partnerships uh, between these groups with specific research needs and pair them with members of the scientific community who have experience and resources to address those needs. So this is a free hybrid public event consisting of project presentations by partnership groups and informational sessions regarding how to form and fund partnerships. So furthermore, there's going to be additional networking opportunities with the presenters and other community-based organizations. So registration is now open. You can find that on our website and you can join us in person or virtually for all or part of the event on July 12th. I don't have any new uh, covered action certification since our last update. I do have one comment letter on June 6, council staff submitted a comment letter to the El Dorado Irrigation District regarding their CEQA initial study and negative declaration for a five year conserved water transfer. The letter outlines that based on the location and the scope of the transfer, the project appears to meet the definition of a covered action. So the council invites the district to engage with council staff in early consultation before submittal of a certification of consistency to discuss the transfer. Council staff are available to discuss the issues outlined in the letter as the irrigation district proceeds in the next stages of its project approvals. Uh, I wanna note that in your packet this month, you have the outreach highlights report and the active projects list, which talks about all of the different uh, projects in the Delta that we are tracking in various planning stages. Um, we're uh, on the topic of our outreach. We uh, are getting a lot of attention online for our upcoming Bay Delta Science Conference. That content earned top attention on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook recently. We've also gotten positive follower growth on all four of our social media platforms, as well as our email subscription list. And we're getting a really great open rate on our email announcements, uh, better than average. We do not have a legal update today, and as the chair mentioned, we'll take the legislative update a little bit later in the agenda. 
And so now I'd like to invite our, uh, our Delta agency partners to provide their presentations. And I think first up, we have Campbell Ingram, Executive Officer of the Delta Conservancy. But we're gonna, sorry, we're gonna start with Bruce Blodgett of the Delta Protection Commission. I think Bruce is with us virtually. Sorry about that, I had to unmute there. Well, I appreciate it, uh, the opportunity to speak. I have a couple items to go over today. I'm Bruce Blodgett with the Delta Protection Commission. And uh, again, always a, a pleasure to be able to talk to the council about some of the projects going on over here at the Delta Protection Commission. Uh, first and foremost, National Heritage Area. Uh, we are still the only National Heritage Area in the state of California designated. Our management plan was submitted in March and we expect its final approval at the latest by September of this year. So what happens is we, we complete our management plan and it goes back to the National Park Service for final approval. And then it comes back to us for final approval if they have major amendments or which we're not expecting. But um, yeah, this is one of the things that uh, is, is very exciting, has a lot of opportunity here to bring some, some federal funding into the Delta. So that's always a good thing. So we, we've been moving forward with that. Uh, our National Heritage Area Plant Advisory Committee uh, actually expires. So we, we are reformulating that to turn it into an entity that will help manage the heritage area moving forward. So that's something that we're going to be working on and presenting some changes to the commission in July. Uh, we're going to have a forum on Friday, November 15th at the Antioch Historical Museum. So this will be a, a free event, full day event. Uh, we're going to working with some partners to find a little bit of food for people. And uh, but we're going to have a, a Delta Heritage Forum on Friday, November 15th out at the Antioch Historical Museum. Some other exciting news. Uh, we started back early this year uh, working with West Sacramento, Yolo County, Yolo Transportation District and applied for a grant to extend and create a Clarksburg Branch Line Trail, uh, a trail basically from West Sacramento uh, into Clarksburg. Uh, the group as a whole, we applied for a grant and we were approved for $1.9 million um, to fund the analysis of this, this proposed trail and to propose, you know, best alternatives for moving this forward. So this is roughly 6.4 miles of trail, class one, separated trail. The second part of this, which is really exciting as well, is also include fiber optic connectivity. So we're going to be putting a trail in or potentially putting a trail in and fiber optics into Clarksburg, something that doesn't exist currently. So that's something that's very exciting and, and can be very beneficial to the residents along the way and also those residents of, of, of Clarksburg. So this is part of the Delta Trail Master Plan that was approved by our commission back in in 2022. A couple land use items of note um, and might be of note to you. Uh, we've been working with Contra Costa County. Contra Costa County is updating, is, is Supervisor Burgess is sitting there, is updating their general plan. Some of those plans and policies obviously may have some effect on the, on the uh, primary zone of the Delta. So we have been reviewing that and making sure that those things and, and suggesting policies to make that consistent with our land use and resource management plan. Um, Zanker resource management proposal uh, is a green waste facility proposed for Twin Cities Road uh, on the Delta side, the primary zone of the Delta off of I-5. So a major urban waste collection facility that they're gonna turn into, um, that they're gonna turn into mulch. Uh, problematic in terms of its location for some obvious reasons, especially being the primary zone. So we've been uh, working with working with Sacramento County to express those concerns and to, to make sure that they understand that in the primary zone of the Delta, this is going to be quite a challenge from both your standpoint and our standpoint. So we have a number of other projects uh, that, that we're working on, but those are really the key highlights and I don't want to take the time, too much time of your agenda today. So with that, I'll, I'll just hold for any and pause for any questions. Uh, 
Okay. Any questions from the members online? Okay. Then I'll invite up Campbell Ingram. Ingram, thank you very much, Bruce. Thank you. From the Delta Conservancy to provide his update. Welcome, Campbell. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and Council members. It's good to be here. Looks like I just made it just in time. <laughs> uh, and now, uh, welcome, uh, Council Member Miller, um, formerly of the Delta Conservancy Board. It's good to see you on screen. It's a new configuration. Uh, so, I just want to give a couple quick updates for the Delta Conservancy. Um, we are very much hoping that there is a climate bond that moves forward because we are very close to the end of our available funding for um, for all of our work. We're down to just the last few pennies. So we are really shifting our focus right now to seeking federal funding and other funding sources uh, that is you know that we can. We're excited that next week we're going to submit a resource conservation service grant. Uh, it's called the RCPP. Uh, Regional Conservation Partnership Program. Uh, they have a maximum award of 25 million, so we're gonna ask for the full 25 million. And that's really to continue to support the, the nature-based solutions work that we've done over the last couple of years with California General Fund. You may recall that we put about $36 million to about 11,000 acres in the Delta that will convert to rice and managed wetland to reduce carbon emissions, stop subsidence in those areas, and will ultimately achieve about 110 thousand tons of avoided carbon emissions per year. So we're excited about that. Very excited about the potential to get this federal funding to continue that work into the future. Um, also have a couple of smaller grants um, that we're seeking. And then um, we're hoping to maybe take over the clean vessels program in the Delta. So the San Francisco estuary program used to run that and it was for the Delta, the Bay and the um, from Monterey all the way up to Eureka. And so the San Francisco Estuary Program has determined that it's really not within their, 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 the things they do. So they have, uh, they've decided not to run the program anymore. So we are applying to the Department of Boating and Waterways for a grant to run that program. It's well beyond our scope of just the Delta, but we are by statute allowed to work outside the Delta, provided there's a clear benefit to the Delta and keeping boat bilge water out of the system, moving back and forth on the tides clearly um, is in that, that, that mix. So we will be applying for that. We hope that we can get that. And, uh, and then again, we're also hoping that uh, there's a bond on the ballot very soon. One other thing I want to mention, um, we've talked here a little bit before about the Delta Drought Response Pilot Program. It's a program we, we ran for two years in a row during the drought, funded by the Department of Water Resources. And the second year report is just about finalized and will be available here next month. We'll be presenting it to our board at our July 24 board meeting. We had a forum at the Ride Hotel on the 20th, which I think was last week. It was last week, time's flying. Um, and it was a really excellent experience. We had 60 people attend in person. Um, there were 11 individual growers who participated lots of agency folks and, and consultants and, and all the, the folks that you would sort of anticipate. And it was a great opportunity to share the results of that study, that analysis, uh, and get feedback on it as well. Interestingly, there was a, a call for us to continue to do that work, um, although you know, the, the learning that happened, even though that uh, uh, you know, we're clearly not in drought. So the takeaway from the report is that mostly due to elevation, the fact that a lot of the land in the Delta is below sea level. There was not a tremendous amount of water saved in the drought response program. We, we reduced applied water, but the evapotranspiration was still fairly significant because plants sub-irrigate in the Delta. That's a shallow water table and they have water moves laterally through the peat soil. But nonetheless, we learned quite a bit. And what we also learned was that in the upper elevations, when you start to get out of the peat soil and out of the subsided area, you do save more water. So it's really important information, both for the farmers in the Delta, how do they manage through the drought as well as the state. So um, we'll make a presentation on the report when it's out available to the Stewardship Council as well, if you, if you would like that. I think that concludes my report, unless there's any questions. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Chair. Oh, sorry. 
Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Gail. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Um, no questions, but I really do just want to congratulate you on an amazing program and serving so many different areas in the Delta and the phenomenal work that you and your team do and the, the respect that you give and, and your ability to, to treat each region as it should be independently and thoughtfully, um, your commitment to, to environmental justice. And it's just been uh, remarkable to see you build to build um, the conservancy and all the work you've done. So I certainly miss you, but um, learned a lot from you about the Delta and hope obviously to continue learning. So thank you, Mr. Ingram. Yeah, and I guess I can, much. I too, now that I don't work in at the Department of Finance, can hope that a bond passes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, very, thank, much. Thank you yeah. very much for your work. Thanks, Campbell. So on the remainder of today's agenda, our Delta lead scientist is on vacation, but we are going to hear a brief Delta science report from our deputy director for science, our, um, Henry DeBay. Council staff is going to give an overview of the Delta Science Program scientific peer review function alongside representatives from Department of Water Resources and the Bureau of Reclamation. And then we'll close our meeting um, with an update from DWR on the Delta Conveyance Project and their recently released cost benefit analyses for the project. And then of course our legislative report. And that's all I have, unless there are any questions. Okay. okay. Are there any public comments? No, Madam Chair, there are not. Thank you. All right, well, we'll move right into the lead scientist report. I uh, will introduce Henry DeBay, our Deputy Executive Officer. Can you hear me? Uh, Good morning, Chair, Council Members. As uh, as the Chair mentioned, my name is Henry DeBay. I'm the Deputy Executive Officer for Science at the Council, um, filling in for Dr. Wyndham Myers today. And I'll try not to let you down too much with this uh, lead scientist report. So today I'll spend a few minutes covering three things. Uh, this month's article highlight, some Delta Science Program programmatic updates, and the By the Numbers report. Uh, so with the visual abstract up on the screen, I'll start with the uh, the article. Um, so this month's article is titled Prototyping Structured Decision-Making for Water Resource Management of the San Francisco Bay Delta. And it was authored by USGS scientist Dr. Jim Peterson and others in the journal Environmental Science and Policy. There are a few reasons we're highlighting this article today. One, this paper was just published last month. Uh, two, it's a good opportunity to highlight structured decision making, an approach that's increasingly being used in the Delta. Three council staff, specifically senior engineer Ben Geske, was actually involved in this effort. But before walking through the visual abstract, I do want to just provide a bit of background. So first of all, what is structured decision making or SDM for short? And basically, it's a, a framework for making informed uh, and transparent choices in complex decision situations. And specifically, SDM can help to break down management decisions and actions into digestible components. It can bring uh, different points of view together and foster collaboration and transparency. It can also incorporate models and data, and it can help to bridge the scientist manager gap. And I was trying to think of a good analogy for SDM and, and the best one I could come up with actually is on the same wavelength of what uh, the chair was mentioning earlier, but that's a supercharged version of planning a family vacation um, in which First, as a group, uh, you may need to decide on a vacation type, say a beach or a mountain trip. Then you set your goals. Do you want to relax or have some adventure or a combination thereof? You identify possible destinations to meet those vacation goals, and then you evaluate and compare each destination in terms of cost and travel and other considerations. And then you choose the best option and you go. Um, so it's that same stepwise approach that's helpful for informing and supporting decision making in the Delta where the system is complex and there are many different management objectives and possible management actions. So what the authors did in this study is what's called a prototype SDM to evaluate the effects of alternative management actions on multiple fish and water objectives. 
So SDM can take a long time. So a prototype approach can be quicker. It can help people to understand what it is and determine if it's the right approach for the problem being addressed. And so how did they go about it? So the visual abstract here up on the screen outlines the six standard steps for an SDM process or seven. Some, some folks consider it seven. So step one, they identified the problem statement. So the problem statement was actually quite long, so I won't rehash it here, but it basically boils down to how can water supply and fish recovery be simultaneously prioritized, objectives that are often seen to be at odds. Step two, with that problem statement in mind, the group settled on four management objectives, maximize delta smelt populations, maximize Chinook salmon populations, minimize losses to water availability and reliability, and minimize losses of agricultural revenue. Step three, then the group brainstormed 14 management actions that could meet those four goals. These actions included everything from reservoir releases to adding fish, from hatcheries to adding sediment for delta smelt habitat. Step four, they then modeled all of these actions using models of fish community dynamics and hydrology and made what's called a consequence table or influence diagram to show the net positive, negative, or neutral effects on the different objectives. Step five, through this consequence table or influence diagram, the group could then see the trade-offs of the different actions. Some of the results were not surprising, like adding fish eggs or fish food helped the fish populations, but others were and, and showed somewhat unexpected co-benefits. In particular, two actions had no negative effect on water objectives, yet boosted both smelt and salmon populations with food. Uh, and these, these actions included one, the Fremont Weir Notch, which allows fish migration through the Yolo Bypass. And the second was a targeted pulse of water through the Yolo Bypass to augment fish food. So step six, recognizing that all of these data and models have different parameters and levels of uncertainty, they did what's called a sensitivity analysis to identify the biggest areas of uncertainty. In this case, they determined that uncertainty stemmed from Chinook salmon reproduction, as well as the limited availability of contaminants data. Step seven in the final step, uh, implementation and monitoring. Because this was a prototype SDM, they didn't actually implement a decision, but they did determine that resource managers in the Delta would benefit from pursuing an SDM uh, to assess the effectiveness of water management, restoration, and other natural resource management activities. So in conclusion, the authors described that despite multiple decades of research and monitoring in the Bay Delta, the information collected in the system is often inconsistently linked to decision making, and that SDM could help with that. And the authors also point out the usefulness of SDM, not just for the final decisions themselves, but for getting partners to consensus on the problem statement and to identify key data and models needed to support that decision making. And that's it on the article highlight, but I'll stop there for any questions. So I don't have any questions. Dan Zingali. Thank you. I was just wondering, um... On the objective about agricultural income, is there a an alternative that corresponds to that? Some some kind of a proposal that matches the that objective? Uh, I don't I don't know. I, I guess could you say a little bit more about what you have in mind? Well, if I understood the steps correctly, you have objectives like increased delta smelt, Chinook salmon, and then I thought you mentioned something about protecting agricultural income. Yeah, um, minimizing, let me just see. Yeah, minimizing losses of agricultural revenue. Okay, so then I thought the next category, the alternatives kind of were in response to those objectives or ways of addressing those objectives, identifying actions. So I was just wondering if there was anything, an action, what kind of action would that be to uh, minimize agricultural losses? That's a good question. Um, I don't have the article in front of me. Totally should have brought it. That's okay. Um, and you and I, you can maybe send us something later if there's something worth. Yeah, that's a really good thought, that. though. But I think, um, you know, each of these objectives, there's ways to just maximize or minimize that specific objectives. And the, the kind of the, the best actions to support all of the objectives at the same time are the actions that I mentioned, but there's probably actions that would 
prioritize minimizing the losses of agricultural revenue um, over the other objectives. But what that is exactly, I, it's probably in the paper, so I will get back to you. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you, and thanks for the presentation. Mm -hmm. I loved your analogy about uh, vacationing, and it sounds like uh, I need to hire you to plan my next vacation because that was a very organized way to do it, and I'm not sure I'm that organized. So thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I was a little bit worried to go too far afield into vacation land and then have to zoom back out to, to the Delta, but thanks for sticking with me. Okay, if there aren't any other questions, I'll just cover other uh, science program programmatic updates and the By the Numbers report. Um, so as always, folks in the Delta Science Program have been busy. Uh, last month, the Delta Science Program hosted a career workshop for the 2022 Class of Delta Science Fellows. These eight fellows are early career at the master's, PhD, and postdoctoral levels and were competitively awarded funds to pursue research projects for two years. Fellows have been researching everything from pesticide management to studying learning and cooperation in the Delta's governance system. Um, but the purpose of this workshop was really to equip fellows with key training and skills on everything from interviewing to science communication and more. And Executive Officer Jessica Pearson provided welcoming remarks and highlighted the value of the Council's Fellows Program in developing future science and management leaders in the Delta. Uh, and Dr. Maggie Chrisman and George Isaac from the science program and our partner, California Sea Grant, were really critical in pulling off um, this event. And while we're wrapping up this cohort of fellows, we're already gearing up for the next cohort of 2025 Delta Science Fellows. Uh, just recently, we received 37 notices of intent across disciplines and for different projects. And that may not seem like a big number, but that's roughly double the number of applications that we usually see for this fellowship which really shows the level of interest. And unfortunately, we only have six fellowship spots, so it's gonna be pretty competitive this time around. In May, the Delta Science Program also convened a quarterly meeting of the Sassoon Adaptive Management Advisory Team, or Sassoon AMAT. This team is made up of local, state, and federal agencies, and it supports adaptive management requirements under the Sassoon Marsh Plan and Delta Plan, including habitat restoration projects and scientific monitoring in Sassoon Marsh, which is in Solano County. Uh, this, this last Sassoon AMAT meeting was very site visit focused and it included touring different projects across Sassoon Marsh that are restoring tidal wetlands, monitoring carbon fluxes, reversing subsidence and restoring wetlands by reusing dredge sediment from the bay. And a big thanks there to Dr. Dylan Chapel and Dr. Elizabeth Brasati in the Adaptive Management Unit for making that meeting happen. Um, Earlier this month, uh, the Delta Science Program senior engineer Ben Geske traveled to Annapolis, Maryland to be a panelist at the Chesapeake Community Research Symposium. Ben shared the work that's been happening in the Delta on promoting a modeling collaboratory. Uh, admittedly, we're in, in pretty nascent stages, but the Chesapeake Bay Program is, is much further along in their integrated modeling efforts. Um, but that's great because um, we can uh, they can provide case studies for us to learn from. And, and still their SUA shares a lot of the same challenges that we do in the Bay Delta, everything from HABs to invasive species. So the symposium was a good opportunity uh, for Ben on behalf of the science program to strengthen those connections and coordination with that group. Finally, a couple items to put on your radar. Uh, nominations for the Brown Nichols Award are due July 15th. Um, this award recognizes the contributions of a scientist for significant research and active involvement in facilitating the use of science. Um, to manage the San Francisco estuary and watershed, and the winner will be announced at the next 2024 Bay Delta Science Conference at the Safe Credit Union Convention Center, September 30th to October 2nd. So please consider nominating or spreading the word about this request for nominations. We're also, as, as the chair mentioned earlier, halfway through our Delta Research Awards seminar series. Um, First, a big thanks to, to Chair Julie Lee for joining so many of those, and, and a big thanks to Dylan Stern, Eva Sedaris, and Megan Nguyen from the Science Program for making them happen, and our, our public participation team. Um, we're excited to report that they've been uh, well attended with an average of 36 attendees per seminar, and that's not including council staff. Uh, including folks from the legislature, local, state, and federal agencies, NGOs, academia, and the public. 
So as was mentioned earlier, recordings of the seminar are posted on our YouTube channel and information sheets of each of the projects are available on the council website. So that's it for the programmatic updates. And then if there aren't any questions, I can move on to the by the numbers report, but I'll stop. No, thanks for mentioning um, the legislative interest too. That was something I wanted to highlight because that was great to see as well. So thank you. Any questions from members? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, let's move on. Great, thanks. Yeah, and thanks to Brandon Chapin for, for promoting that series with the legislature. Um, so let's, if we could have the by the numbers report up on the screen, please. So just before diving into these numbers, I do want to provide just a note on the broader seasonal outlook for California, and it's probably not surprising. Uh, so the latest uh, update from the ensemble of predictive models is showing that the three-month period from July to September will be hot and dry across the southwestern U.S. and into California. And most of California's forecast to see temperatures one to two degrees above normal from July to September, with interior parts of the state seeing average temperatures three to four degrees above normal. So the summer of 2024 is shaping up to be another one of the hottest on record. So with that in mind, um, there was no additional precipitation this month. So, so the total shown here are the same ones as we showed in May. Uh, there also weren't any significant changes in reservoir storage. The Sacramento Valley reservoirs are still fairly close to capacity, especially Oroville, uh, and are at above average for this state based on the historical average. Water temperatures throughout the system are pretty close to average for this time of year with Clear Creek up near Shasta, uh, still a cold 56 degrees, uh, and temperatures near the mouth of the Delta and the water pumping stations and the Southern Delta being much warmer, though still normal for this time of year. In terms of flow conditions at the Sacramento River near Freeport, uh, we're at 15,378 cubic feet per second, uh, which is 83% of the average flow. Uh, for the San Joaquin at Vernalis, it's roughly 2,800 CFS, which is 57% of the historical average. And for the combined Central Valley and State Water Project diversion um, in the Southern Delta, uh, it's 5,700 CFS, which is 103% of average. So with that, that concludes the LSR. And I'll just say, I don't know how Lisa Marie does this every month, but I appreciate it. Thank you. Any questions? Member Burgess. Uh, just clarifying on those percentages related to flow, is that for this time of the year or is that average? Uh, oh, good. I got you. No, I'm yeah. kidding. No, I'm just curious. I, I, it might be in the fine print. I can't remember if it's since the start of the water year for this particular like flow rate for this particular month. I mean, um, 57% is is pretty low compared to these other numbers. So I thought, well, maybe that's average flow throughout the year. Yeah, I'll have to get back to you. I, I would I would lean towards assuming that it's for this time of the year, but based on a historical average. Okay. Thank um you. yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um I noticed that we changed the format a little bit on the reservoir storage. Thank you for that, because uh, I always felt stupid to ask before, but now that I see that what remaining capacity dotted line is, that was super helpful. Great. Yeah. And there you can't really see the remaining capacity for Oroville just because Oroville is at 97 percent capacity. So it would be kind of you just can't see it. Oroville is basically almost full. Got it. All right. Any other questions? All right. Are there any public comments on this item? No, Madam Chair, there are not. All right. Henry, you can stay here. I think you're next up, too. Are you introducing the oh, right. panel? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so we're going to move on to uh, our next okay. agenda item, which is the yeah. independent scientific peer review. A break. But first, we're going to take a break. <laughs> <laughs> Taking a five-minute break. Five-minute break. Okay. Thank Sounds you. good. Thank you. All right, we're back from our brief break. 
We are on agenda item number eight, the independent scientific peer review. This is our Delta Science program staff providing an overview of the independent scientific peer review and related services. So I'll ask Henry DeBay to introduce his team. Great, thank you so much, Chair. Um, so I have the pleasure of uh, welcoming the next panel up to the table. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Rachel Klopfenstein, Environmental Program Manager with the Delta Science Program, Tricia Lee, Senior Environmental Scientist at the Science Program, Aaron Angel, Environmental Scientist at the Science Program, as well as some guests, uh, Andrew Schwartz, the State Water Project's Climate Action Manager at the Department of Water Resources, and um, Dr. Randy Field, a uh, hydrologic engineer at the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Rachel. Thank you very much. We're getting our photo op. Um, <laughs> hello, Chair Lee and council members. Can you hear me okay? Great. Yes. My name is Rachel Kloffenstein, the program manager for the Delta Science Program's Collaborative Science and Peer Review, or CSPR unit. Thank you so much for your time today. Slide over. Um, we're excited to be here today to provide an update on the critically important peer review services that we provide in a system as complex as the Delta, where the stakes for water and ecosystem management are high. Peer review is extremely important to ensuring that decisions are informed by the best available science. And we believe that maintaining this service is imperative to furthering the co-equal goals. So let's get into it. I wanna start off with an introduction to the folks that you'll hear from today. First, from the CSPR unit, we have senior environmental scientist, Trisha Lee, and environmental scientist, Aaron Angel. We're also fortunate to be joined by two members of our current peer review partners for, partners for peer review, Andrew Schwartz from the Department of Water Resources and Randy Field from the US Bureau of Reclamation. I'll let them introduce themselves in a moment, but I'm going to provide first an explanation on how we facilitate and coordinate independent scientific peer review in the Delta and why the contributions from this team and this process are important to science and decision making in the Delta. Next slide. So we're going to start with the background on our peer review process and kind of how we do it. Um, then I'll pass it off to folks in the report in the unit to report out on some of the peer reviews that we've facilitated in the last year. Um, with input from our guests about how they plan to use the information from these reviews and why they continue to seek our peer review services. Next slide. And one more, please. So I first want to highlight that the mission of the Delta Science Program called for in the Delta Reform Act is to provide the best possible unbiased scientific information to inform water and environmental decision making in the Delta. And peer review is one of the Delta Science Program's core functions, among others. Peer review is also sort of a legacy function of the CalFed program and is intended to increase transparency and to ensure that credible and legitimate science is used by water and environmental decision makers. And it's very critical in helping to build trust in decision making. Next slide. Since 2010, the Delta Science Program has coordinated 34 peer review and advice panels. And the science program plays an important role here as an honest broker for coordinating reviews of government science and is well poised given our experience. I'm gonna talk through the full process that we run through in a moment. But first, um, you can see from this graph here, the extent of the peer review experience across a range of topics for a variety of state and federal partners. This includes fish focused or habitat invasive species, modeling and much more. And we typically facilitate reviews of complex science that underlies management, such as for long-term water operations that benefit from additional expert review and the opportunity to address issues in an open process. And the difference between our review and advice is typically that review evaluates completed scientific and technical processes, programs, and plans. It's like a final step in the process. And advisors typically give input on the development of or earlier stage of these efforts. But both reviews and advice respond to a set of questions, like a, a charge, and produce a, a final written product. Our process is slightly different um, from other reviewers in the system, like the Independent Science Board, primarily in the specificity of the review. We have each set of charge questions as catered for each individual review. 
for example, the Delta Independent Science Board and other larger kind of federal level review panels like the National Research, Research Council provide periodic high level reviews of programs and specific topics with much broader implications for resource management. Um, and our process is not only specific, um, there are other examples in the system that do provide um, specific uh, reviews, but our process is also very transparent and tested given our uh, successful history. Next slide. So as I mentioned, the Delta Science Program acts as the kind of liaison between the requesting party and the panel to foster an open and transparent process. So the, pro the process that we run through starts on the left of the screen here, first with a request for review and with input from our Delta lead scientist and considering our own capacity, we make a decision to accept the review uh, request and respond with a formal letter. Next, we work closely with the requesting party to scope out the review, thinking about the timeline, the charge questions, the scope and the format, like do we need to have a public meeting? We then select reviewers, check for conflicts of interest and contract with them to make sure that they're compensated for their work. And then the reviewers get to work together when necessary or individually and sometimes at a public meeting. Lastly, the reviewers submit their final report and, or reports and the Delta Science Program conducts an editorial review. So at this stage, the science program may suggest grammatical or formatting edits to improve the panel report but do not otherwise substantively amend or review the product. And then afterwards, we post all the materials on the council's website and transmit the final report to the requesting party. And you may have seen some of our recent listserv email announcements um, announcing the final product being, being circulated and posted as we notice all of them publicly. Um, and that's a good segue to hearing more about some of our recent peer reviews. So next slide, please. And next. So I'm just going to quickly introduce one of the reviews that we facilitated for the Department of Water Resources last year for the Delivery Capability Report, or DCR, then turn it over to Andrew Schwartz. The State Water Project provides critical water infrastructure for California, and its supply depends on a host of variables, such as snowpack, pumping capabilities, and regulatory mandates. And to provide essential information about the current and projected water supply reliability of the state, the Delta, or the, sorry, DWR issues a DCR every two years, which is then used extensively by state water project contractors and others to plan their water use. As you can imagine, getting this right is extremely important. And the contractors of the state water project asked for this review in response to DWR's proposed um, changes to the methods. So the goal was really to provide feedback on the uh, revised kind of data and methods used in the DCR to model conditions that have changed and will continue to change moving forward. And the review occurred in two parts. First, on DWR's adjustments to the DCR to better account for climate and hydrologic changes in the data set and the models. And then on the process developed by DWR to construct multiple risk-informed scenarios um, for climate change for future DCRs. So really looking at ahead at changing future products. Um, and this was just a letter review, meaning there was no consensus report or public meeting, but the three experts reviewed the DCR in two parts, responding to each of these two prompts um, and completed their products in July and September of last year. So next slide, please. And with that, I'll pass it off to Andrew. Council members, Madam Chair, it's a it's a pleasure to be with you again. If I if I look familiar to some of you, it's probably because uh, I I spent several years as the lead engineer in the planning uh, program for the Delta Stewardship Council. So it's nice to be back with you today um, and talking about this important work and and our collaboration with the science program. Um, so the 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 state water project uh, delivery capability report, uh, as Rachel mentioned, is 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 a super important report that the department issues every two years, and it really covers both the existing capabilities of the of the the project, and also looks out twenty years into the future, and and projects what we think we can deliver in terms of water reliability. Uh, in the future under climate change conditions. And, and we look at dry years and wet years and then a long-term average. 
And this is really important information that finds its way into a number of planning documents throughout the state from uh, folks that get water from the state water project. So we this, this information gets into um, sustainable groundwater management plans, uh, urban water management plans, ag water management plans, and other integrated regional water management plans. So this is this is really important for all Californians that get their water uh, from the state water project. And then internally, it also serves as the basis for many of our planning processes for how we uh, look at the energy we're going to need to procure for the system, feasibility studies for adding uh, elements to the system, and then CEQA documents as well. So this was uh, a really important set of information that finds its way into a lot of other processes. Next slide. Um, some of the key review outcomes that we got from this review. Uh, most importantly, I think the reviewers agreed uh, unanimously that that both the methods uh, that we used to improve our processes in both of the reviews uh, were an improvement from previous methods and approaches and really gave us confidence that this was the right uh, direction moving forward. And more importantly, uh, as Rachel mentioned, this review was, was requested by our state water project contractors and the folks that use this information. And so this really was important for them to have confidence in this information that, that they could, uh, that it's not just DWR saying this is the right way to go and the, these are good uh, numbers to use, but that a, a panel of experts uh, back that up. Uh, and then it, it provided important feedback on the organization and documentation of the report and the analysis. And we made lots of changes based on their feedback from the draft that they saw to the final that was actually the final reports that were actually released. And then in addition, um, because of the timeline of this project, we all, always knew that there was going to be limited time to incorporate large scale feedback into our analysis and 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 processing um, from the, the, the committee's recommendations. Uh, and so we had structured the review and the charge to, you know, really look at both what we could do now and then, you know, what should we be looking at in future iterations of this as we keep improving on our processes. And they provided lots of suggestions uh, for continued improvements in our process um, and really a to-do list of, of future efforts. So, so we've got that and uh, we've got um, a lot of continuous work to do in the next several years. And as I said, we we update this every two years. So we have opportunities to to continue to iterate on this. Next slide. Um, I think I, I just want to um, finish up with, you know, a little summary of why this DSP peer review was so useful for the DCR. And I, and I touched on this before, but it, it really provided confidence that our methods were sound. Uh, that folks can rely on this information and that, you know, others had reviewed it outside independently um, beyond just our, our staff and our, our collaborators. Uh, it was uh, transparent and, and gives us a, a much higher level of accountability. And this is something that, that we want to do on more of our, of our products uh, throughout, not just in the SWP, but throughout DWR and something that we've been talking about and having a lot of conversations about internally of, of trying to think about where does peer review really belong and where can we expand it throughout the things that we're doing and working on. Really important was the faster timeline than traditional, like going to a journal and publishing. First of all, practice-based uh, research and, and development like this is, is often difficult to publish. There are more and more journals that will publish it, but it's still very difficult to publish. It takes much longer than the timeline we had. Um, and, you know, you get to submit, a, you know, maybe a 10 page uh, paper, you know, or article, um, whereas both of these documents that were reviewed were close to 100 pages and very in depth. So, um, just much greater depth of evaluation that was provided through this process. We looked at lots of different um, potential peer review outlets that were out there, and this was really the best fit for what for what we wanted to do. And then I think it, it was really important that that we had really 
greater input on the on the scope of the review and also the expertise that would be necessary to get a good review of it. We felt for these uh, reviews that folks that had a, a good systems engineering and and water resource background and also climate um, climate change science background would be would be really important. And the panel uh, that that DSP uh, selected really exemplified the the expertise that we thought was needed for this so they did a great job on on choosing the the uh, the experts and and we think that the the panel did a great job of reviewing the the documents so i think that's that's all i had to say thank you i think we can go to the next slide please Hello, council members, Chair Lee. Um, up next, I'm going to introduce uh, the next review for U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, um, and this was for their fish and aquatic effects analysis for the coordinated long-term operations of the Central Valley Project and State Water Project. So in order to wake, make changes to the way that the water projects are operated, Reclamation has to first um, prepare a report that's mandated by the National Environmental Protection Act, which is called the Environmental Impact Statement. In addition, they've also reinitiated consultation with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fisheries Service under the Endangered Species Act, and this is due to anticipated, um, anticipated modifications to the proposed water operations, which may cause effects to endangered species um, as well as designated critical habitats. And so as part of this process, uh, Reclamation prepared an analysis that assesses those potential impacts on species and habitats, and this is called the biological assessment. And so this biological assessment is then evaluated by those fisheries um, agencies. And so the fish and aquatic effects analysis that we're referring to here is essentially portions of those draft documents. So the environmental impact statement and biological assessment. And so a highlight here is that Reclamation really wants to ensure this analysis is done correctly because of its Im implications for water operations and endangered species management. And so uh, the goal for the panel was to provide feedback um, for improving the methodology uh, for this analysis. And the review format was a co-authored panel letter by five experts and took place beginning last November and concluded in March of this year. Next slide, please. And so now I just wanted to highlight a few of the key findings from the panel. So first, they noted that with continued diligence and incorporation of their comments, Reclamation's analysis could provide a sound scientific basis for assessing uh, project impacts on listed species. And second, in general, the analyses considered the major stressors. However, there were some exceptions that they identified in the appendix of their final report. And finally, uh, the fact that many of the modeled alternatives produce similar responses may indicate some issues with the models that may have led to an underestimation of the effects on species or habitats, or that the common driver of climate change dominated the model responses. And so overall, the panel acknowledged this impressive effort to date and provided many suggestions for updated or modified methods that would improve this analysis. And next, I'll hand it off to Trisha to introduce another uh, reclamation review. And next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so reclamation also contracted with the, the Delta Science Program to facilitate a peer review on water temperature modeling. Um, this is a platform that they developed. Cold water management is a key management parameter for operation of the Central Valley Project. It protects cold water species like the winter run Chinook salmon. Reservoirs in the Central Valley Project can stratify, and through controlling where in the reservoir water is released, operators can meet water temperature standards. This modeling platform was developed to assist water operators with this water temperature management. The goal of this review was to build confidence and trust in the development of the modeling platform and to provide an independent analysis of the integrity of the modeling platform as well as to review the technical performance and validity of the models, model framework, and implementation of the platform. This was a five-person joint panel, repo uh, panel report that was conducted in two parts. 
So first, a midterm review was conducted in July 2022 on a subset of the reservoirs in the Central Valley project. And the reviewers provided recommendations for the final development of the platform. And then a second and final review was conducted in September 2023 on the whole system in which the reviewers got to review the expanded application of the modeling platform, as well as how their midterm recommendations were integrated. So next slide. So the five person panel found that the modeling elements were consistently developed, they were consistent with the project objectives, and they were adequate for water temperature management. They also found that the model development had been conducted in an open and transparent manner, which really allowed um, the reclamation had really allowed for opportunities for stakeholder engagement throughout the development of the platform. And models and data were also ultimately provided to the community to bolster both in-house and stakeholder capabilities. And now I will turn it to Randy Field from Reclamation. All right, can we get the next slide, please? Um, a pleasure to be here uh, representing Reclamation and sharing our uh, experience with the Delta Stewardship Panel Science uh, Peer Review. Um, so we were asked um, how Reclamation used this information and with our two different uh, uh, evaluations for peer review, one has been categorized as a highly scientific um, and influential assessment, and this would be the first uh, that was identified under the fish and aquatic analysis. This was categorized at a high departmental level. And what we're doing, um, as was alluded to, uh, is really targeting the improvement on the methodology and part of the process. Um, so this is targeting that ESA listed species um, that we mentioned uh, and influence both our regulatory documents. So these are really getting the formation of our, what we call a, a proposed action, and then finally a record of decision. Um, but this also influences uh, how we go about the process um, for adaptive management. Um, so a key component there in assisting reclamation and that obligation. The second review that we uh, perform with the Delta Stewart Council, um, this water temperature modeling platform, something that was categorized as a influential scientific information. And this actually is a, a tool, as was mentioned before, that supports the consultation activities, um, but it, and it ultimately is also getting to that real-time um, operational component as well. Um, a lot of the information that was provided as feedback from the panel, uh, we immediately could utilize. Um, so again, this harkens back to um, many of the comments that DWR experienced as well. Um, there's some immediate benefits um, to enhance that documentation, um, but also uh, contributing to the long term. Uh, where were we able to shape our long term and future development efforts? Uh, so a lot of uh, now and later um, effort benefit uh, for utilizing this particular tool. Next slide. And then uh, why Reclamation continues to utilize this uh, particular process. Uh, well, I mentioned that there were high level or departmental level categorizations. This comes straight from OMB, um, where we are looking for enhancing the quality of information or ensuring the utility and integrity of the products. This really gets back to um, are we offering up the best available science, um, which is one of our most important charges at Reclamation. Um, from an organizational standpoint, um, so this is really what Reclamation is focusing in on, is to meet our transparency and reproducibility objectives. And then I think ultimately I'm happy to share that the execution um, was extremely positive. We had a very successful experience. I'm very pleased with the professionalism and well-organized process that the Delta District Council can offer. Um, it was a lot of work, um, but I think that really paid off in the end. And I, I think the most important um, parts of, because I did participate in the uh, water temperature modeling platform process and peer review uh, was, was the confirmation 
from the external panel members on suggesting that the methodology and results were adequate. And I think that's just a, a best a voice messaging from an, an independent source um, that the information the information is providing is of quality and um, and ready for utilization within uh, the processes that we're working within. That's all I had. Thank you. Okay, we can have the next slide, please. Okay, so moving forward. Thank you. So before wrapping up, I just wanted to introduce another review, which was recently completed for the Department of Water Resources. So the summer fall habitat action is intended to improve habitat conditions, including the overlap of key attributes such as salinity and turbidity to support Delta smelt. And so this is important because Delta smelt is an endangered species and summer fall conditions are hypothesized to be the bottleneck on the population. So the goal of this review was for a panel of experts to, again, review methodology, uh, but this time for the monitoring and science plans for the summer fall habitat action, as well as the decision approach for supporting uh, summer fall habitat action recommendations. And so the panel consisted of four experts, two with expertise in food webs and fisheries, and two with structured decision-making expertise, who each authored their own letter. And so the review was posted and announced through a council listserv email announcement on Monday, and we can highlight key findings in the next lead scientist report. Great, thanks, Aaron. So next slide, please. Moving forward in furthering our mission of the Delta Science Program, we're excited to continue working with the Department of Water Resources and Reclamation with some ongoing uh, interagency agreements and other partners into the future and hope to continue to make changes and improvements to our process. Uh, for example, there's room to grow in terms of um, our contracting with subject matter experts and diversifying the subject matter experts that we contract with, an opportunity to revisit um, the process that we use and to include it in the next Delta Science Plan where we sort of um, explain our process and continued learning of how to best communicate the outcomes of these reviews. Um, help on that is, is appreciated. Um, so with this presentation, we hope that you learned about the critical services that we provide here in the Delta Science Program and for the Delta and how agencies utilize the service to ensure that the best available science uh, is used to inform decision making. Next slide, please. Now, before I turn it over to you all for questions, um, I just want to say a big thank you to this panel, as well as to our current California Sea Grant State Fellow, Alex Stella and former fellow Eduardo Martinez, who supported multiple of these reviews, as well as Jill Harris, a senior environmental scientist formerly with the unit, who facilitated one of our DWR reviews, and Dylan Stern, another program manager in the Delta Science Program. And lastly, I want to thank um, Dr. Laurel Larson, our former Delta lead scientist, and Lisa Marie Wyndham Myers, um, our current Delta lead scientist, who both play a critical role in the DSP peer review process. So now with that, we'll, we'll take any questions. Great, thank you, and thanks to our guests for coming. Uh, I was really thrilled when I saw this was going to be a topic on our agenda because I think it's super important, the work that you do. It's great to highlight an aspect of the work that the council does that sometimes feels like it's a little less um, you know, because we don't deal with the work you do here in the hearings. Um, I, I'm so happy that we got to highlight the work that you do here. I think it's just really critically important and it really goes to our charge, like you said, about using the best available science and just what that means and how we do that. So um, uh, I'm gonna go to Maria first okay. and then we'll go to Daniel. Sure. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. When was the method, I mean, I know that peer review is such an important thing in everything we do. Um, when you talked about the criteria of picking the peer reviewer, uh, how the, the geograph? I mean, I'm trying to see how do you what the criteria is a little bit if you can shed light on it, and how uh, you know how do we cast our net and how far we go in terms of uh, availability of the scientists to review. 
that's my first question and I have one more. <laughs> Great. For, for that first question, um, we've actually, as I mentioned, the science program has been conducting peer review for over a decade and it's been a function that's kind of been previously uh, associated with this science program. So we actually have a database of hundreds of experts categorized by different um, topics. And so when we are initiating, scoping out a, a review, we work with folks like Andrew and Andrew was explaining the process of they know what's in the document. They know the type of expertise that would be best suited to um, review that product nationally so, nationally yeah so we've had folks from all over um, the country mm -hmm. and sometimes we actually have experts internationally as well right. um, so the database is continuously updated every time that we you know maybe contact someone and they say oh I'm not available but so and so might be great for this as well mm -hmm. we can add those folks to the database and we're constantly trying to think about ways to make sure that we are casting a wide net mm -hmm. and not you know going to the same folks each time sure. and part of that is just building that network um, and finding experts to maintain that database. Sure. That's that's our main approach. Thank you. Yeah. And confirming there's no conflict of interest as well. Nice. My second question. My second question was, you know, the capacity of delivery or is, is just a very important issue for a lot of reasons. And uh, we talked about the, the two aspects that was peer reviewed. Uh, please correct me. It was the species and the temperature. I was wondering if you could shed some light on all the categories or criteria that is being looked in order to define the capacity of delivery, because it's such an important thing. I'm trying to understand that, and I'm trying to see if it's only those two criteria or it's more than this. And I, I'm not, I'm not understanding that it's high science, but if you could summarize at least the categories so there's an understanding for us, because the capacity of delivery is such an important issue in terms of in light of climate change and adaptive management and all of that. Could you please shed some light on that? Can I ask Andrew to shed some, mm -hmm. some light on that? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, um, so what the delivery capability report that we issue looks at is only state water project deliveries. So let's start there. Um, we, essentially model uh, regulatory conditions uh, that exist today. Um, we, re we, we model the current infrastructure as it stands today. So as it's, its current uh, assessed uh, capacity limits and those kinds of things. And then we apply uh, various different hydrology inputs and sea level rise inputs to that to look at these different futures. So the two reviews that we did in this um, were not really about species specifically, but more um, the first thing that we did is this is the first delivery capability report um, that explicitly acknowledges that climate change not only is happening, but has had a quantifiable effect on our ability to deliver water. So I think that's an important uh, step, right? So we use essentially the last hundred years of, of historical experience and, and of, of observed hydrology as kind of the basis and ensemble of year types, if you will, that we can see that we might have to deal with in the future um, when we deliver water. Now, if you think about years from like 1920 to 1950, those are probably, it's probably clear to everybody that we're not likely to see a year as cool uh, as 1920 anymore. But it's not just the temperatures that are going up, our, hydro, our, our precipitation signals is changing as well. And so we've looked at the, you know, kind of the last 30 years of data and really remapped the earlier years to to look, dis, be distributed more like what we see today. Mm -hmm. So we can quantify that impact. So that was one of the pieces. And then looking forward, how do we expect that to change in the future even more with sea level rise and, and, and continued warming and changes in precipitation? And, um, and, and how would we be able to deliver water under those conditions? Sure. So if I walk out of this room and I want to think about how do we measure the delivery capacity is basically the regulatory 
the infrastructure and the hydrology. I think those, I'm simplifying. That's, yes, excellent. <laughs> that's yeah. excellent. And then actually, we have. It, it's funny that you. Yeah, we have a, a a kind of a diagram that we've been using with our executive leadership right. as well. That kind of lays out. There's those three real buckets sure. of things that are essentially knobs or inputs sure. to the 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 um the model uh that we understand are are changing and we we can we can plug those things in and, and look at different and scenarios. a to-do list comes out of it Correct. from the action items and exactly stuff. thank you that was yeah. very that was very good thank you thank you members and golly yeah and thank you maria your um exchange helped me get even an even clearer sense but i really just wanted to echo Julie's uh, appreciation for this presentation, for doing it, and for doing it so well. Just thought you guys um, really, as a cohort of colleagues, did a great job of giving us a concise understanding of the unique value that DSP provides. I love that you did it using real life examples. Um, so thanks for making what are complex subjects to those of us who are not science scientists uh, much clearer in the way you just did. Um, I had one question. Um, I know that peer review is required for papers that are going to be published. Um, not all of the peer reviews you guys are doing are necessarily published papers, correct? So everyone else that's not publishing a paper is basically voluntarily coming to us and saying, we just want this extra level of review. Yeah, I think that's really wonderful and important to kind of highlight. Yeah, as I said, a lot of the topics that were are brought to us are complicated decisions, um, or it's science that's underlying really critical um, management in the system. And while some of the information that's in those products and reports have gone through the peer, rev peer review journal process, um, bringing that all together to justify or inform decisions uh, is still benefits from having external expert review. So that's, I think, yes, it's, it's to, to answer your direct question, it is folks that are motivated to get this ex, extra review, um, and our service that we provide and working with them and creating a, you know, a buffer between a requesting party and a panel of experts provides more transparency. And again, is hopefully something that's building trust in the decisions and, and lets an agency move forward with their decisions with, you know, all of the feedback out there and a better, you know, informed product at the end of it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's something we appreciate that folks in the system are recognizing as an important tool and we're happy to help. Yeah. It's really a testament to the level of work that you guys are doing. So congratulations on that. All right. Member Burgess. Uh, you know, this is so important because first, when everybody's trying to solve a problem, they have to all start to agree on the science. And for a long time, that wasn't always true. Um, and the thing about the science is people have to trust it. And so the fact that you have an independent science board looking at this um, moves towards trying to create that trust so that you can actually sit down and talk about solutions or, you know, make a case for it. So um, it's nice to hear that this has worked for people and I appreciate that part of this presentation. Um, and I appreciate the question on whether it's required. So in some cases it's actually required for certain reasons and other times people are doing it for what reasons? Just to kind of make sure they're going in the right direction or? Well, I think Andrew could probably provide an example for that. It wasn't something that was necessarily required, but they were receiving feedback and a suggestion. So I might punt that one to Andrew just to share a little bit on like more of your motivation. Yeah, in our case, um, we when we put the plan together to say, hey, we're going to make these significant updates and how the DCR represents climate change. We believe climate change change is already impacting our delivery. We want to, we want to incorporate this and we're going to look at new scenarios for the future. Uh, we started to workshop that particularly with the folks who use the delivery capability report. And so these are, you know, uh, engineers and general managers of, of, of water agencies throughout the state. 
And um, one of the first comments was, hey, you know, we make investment decisions and our adaptation decisions based on this information. We really like to see that this is being independently peer reviewed so that we can have the confidence in, in what you all are. We trust you, but trust, yeah. but verify, I guess. Right. <laughs> and that's the whole thing about trust, right? Mm -hmm. right? And you talked about... Um, you know, the data sets and how the prediction models are not necessarily what they used to be. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so I think that's good that we are, you know, bringing people that have different ideas so that we can try to um, be better at the prediction models. Um, the scope of these, is that defined by the requester or is the question provided and the independent science board kind of comes up with what they think? Do you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I can elaborate. And also I just, for the last question that you asked, um, Andrew touched on this a little bit in his presentation that sometimes the academic peer review process is not as well suited for large agency documents and right. things like that. So this service also is another opportunity for agencies to really get some, some expert feedback that's not following that more kind of set process. Mm -hmm. Just want to add that point. Um, but in terms of the scope, um, this is kind of like a, the, I think a fun and interesting part of the review process where a requesting party comes to us and we begin meeting, we being the science program and this requesting party sometimes them individually, sometimes they want other agencies to be involved. It's a planning kind of group or team mm -hmm. um, meets with the science program and the lead scientist, and they present sort of what they want feedback on. Um, and so we go through this iterative process of revising the charge questions, those specific questions they want feedback on. And we'll weigh in on things like, well, that's, that's getting at policy. That's, mm -hmm. you know, let's, where, where, what are you trying to get out of this? Let's keep the questions focused. Um, also like not going beyond the scope of what a panel can do and the amount of time that we allow and avoiding like yes or no questions, you know, and trying to really construct questions that are going to get the feedback from the reviewers that are going to be most effective to the requesting party. So it's primarily the science program working with those, that requesting party and with the lead scientists really heavily weighing in on, on, okay, this final set of questions. We typically present, we, the science program, independently present the questions. We provide the charge to the panel when they're gonna get started. And sometimes there's a time for them to have like clarifying questions. We might minorly adjust a charge question if it just is confusing, doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it's done between, with the requesting party and the lead scientist. Um, and then we we bring those questions to the, to the panel. Okay. Yeah, I just, I think about, you know, this, I don't know if this is a great comparison, but, you know, you go in and you want to see a certain doctor, if they are, you know, an orthopedist, they may say this, if they're a blood person, they may say this, and maybe you haven't invited the right specialist in that can actually solve the problem. So that's kind of what I'm, you know, um, thinking about. So who pays for these reviews? And you said uh, there's a our process offers a specific charge. Out. Was that what? Okay. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah. Um, so some reviews there's there's other agencies that are required to conduct a review um, or other processes, and oftentimes it's a pretty stand. It can be a standard set of questions, mm -hmm. um, meaning you know it's like is the science this or or that? Um, that was so big. But anyway, uh, we we actually walk through what information, what is the goal of this review, mm -hmm. and cater each question. It's the set of questions are going to be different for every single review that we conduct, whereas other processes sometimes follow a standard set of questions. Not a bad thing. It's just that, again, our service is specific and that is better uh, suited for certain agencies' needs. And are there any other independent science board <laughs> services or agencies that, you know, do the same thing or are we... Um, not exactly the same thing, I would say, for for folks, at least in the Delta. Um, 
there's the California Council of, uh, on Science and Technology, CCST. They provide peer review services really similar in the, sco in the scope, meaning they also follow a really rigorous process to make a specific set of char charge questions for a requester, but that um, feedback isn't necessarily posted. It's not a public process. So we combine making it specific and making it a public um, open process. But the Independent Science Board also conducts review. They're just more high level, um, and they tend to set the questions that they are looking at in a review, whereas we are the ones working with an agency to, to figure out the direct questions. Um, and then you might be familiar with the National Academy of Sciences. They also uh, facilitate review, and they're actually facilitating a um, large, like high level review of the related to the long term operations of the Central Valley Project and State Water Project. And they've been turning turning to this review that um, Aaron facilitated for the fish and aquatic effects analysis to inform their process. So we're excited um, to have that connection be made. I think that's an important distinction that you just made too. The Independent Science Board is a, a separate body. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, and yeah. and you right. guys are a peer review, and it's actually part of the council. Yes, yes. correct. Yeah. Okay. And and oh, just for who pays is the agency that is looking for review. We contract with them, or they they contract with us, um, and then we administer the the individual contracts with with experts, subject matter experts. So going back to oh, this, is my last question um, on the scope, do you ever um, recommend bringing, say, a social scientist into these things? Um, do you uh, is there room to add alternatives? If I saw I was trying to find it, but is that part of that, or do you just strictly focus on the question and leave all of the other thoughts out of it? Um, it's a great question. I, I do think that there's a somewhat iterative process where the science program and lead scientists can weigh in to suggest what type of expertise would be best suited. Um, but we also often work with the requesting party and, and the other agencies involved to see to really hear what expertise do they do they think would be most relevant. Um, to date, I think the you know, we have had few social scientists largely due to the questions being asked, but I'm open to it. And that's, a, I think, an important thing the science program is considering. Um, for this recent one, for the fish and aquatic effects analysis, or sorry, for the summer fall habitat action for Department of Water Resources, um, structured decision making was a really important piece. And that's not necessarily something that a biologist or an ecologist is, is it's a very specific skill set. Yeah. Um, and so we, we made sure to find experts with that um, experience. Thank you. Thank you. Member Huesa. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation and thank you for what you do. Um, the, the whole uh, concept of scientific studies has become so important in our society that everybody seems to point to uh, a study that they heard about and how that uh, there was information that came out that results in you know, what, what are the causes of cancer or what are, you know, the causes of climate change or, and there's so many studies now out there that often seem politically motivated, that it really clouds a conversation where people seem to gravitate to a study that supports their view of the world. And so that is the challenge uh, in 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 informing public policy, and that you're talking to people that seem to gravitate to a study that supports their political views, and and then you it doesn't help the political discourse. So so having an agency that is truly independent, and I, I think the key is how do you make this process truly independent and truly uh, uh, transparent? And my you know my first question is. When your studies are conducted and you go through the internal process, do you post the results uh, for the general public to review and to comment on? And that's an opportunity for people of different views to uh, test your modeling and, and your conclusions. Yeah, so um, for us at the science program, when we're facilitating reviews, everything is posted online. Um, and so the final report is, is noticed on our listserv, posted on our website, and we maintain that. In terms of the public process for some of these documents, like some of them are related to a 
CEQA or NEPA process and the environmental impact statement is going to have these public comment opportunities. So mm -hmm. a lot of that is already baked into the, the documents when we get them at the stage that they come to us often. Um, but we're always, I think, thinking about ways to ensure that, you know, additional voices can be brought into our peer review process with the subject matter experts, um, hearing that information when they're also weighing in on the product that's provided. And one of the ways that we do that is if a topic is, you know, uniquely contentious or has a lot of, we know that there's a lot of input to be provided from external groups or interests, um, there'll be a public meeting that's part of the peer review process where the reviewers start, they, pr they present their draft findings at a public workshop. The requesting party can hear. We also often will allow for external presenters to share their input. Um, and so everyone's publicly hearing that. It's also posted online. Um, and then the reviewers take in all that feedback and provide their final recommendations. So that's that's one way when we when we know that that's something that would be beneficial to the process, we'll coordinate a public meeting. And my next question is if if you've ever come up with a result that is implemented into a solution, and solutions most always are political. They very rarely uh, fully, uh, embrace all of the science or recommendations. They they go through a process of, you know, getting people to agree on the best possible solution to to the problem, and it's it's not always the best possible solution because there are political uh, issues to to consider that sometimes some representatives are not comfortable with. Uh, so have has do you have any anecdotal instances in which you came up with a recommendation, there was a policy made on it, and were you able to at least track how that um, solution performed? Uh, was uh, did Do you know of an instance in which you came up with data, there was a response to it, and whether uh, that policy performed well or not? I think that's a great question. I think I'm going to struggle with the answer and 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 having a really direct example. Um, I do think that a lot of the, you know, our panel members here with Andrew and Randy are great because they're the ones that receive the recommendations from the panel. Us at the science program, our our job is to really facilitate this process, make sure that the expert feedback is available for everyone to see. And I think to your point about science and other influences determining decisions that's very valid um, and science isn't the only driver always for decision making mm -hmm. um, but i think for our role it's really to make sure that we're very transparent we're you know getting these experts to provide their input and it's mm -hmm. our hope is that it's up to the agencies to implement those recommendations um, and at but the at very least point, they're held accountable because at some point you may be asked there. i'm so sorry you know, but okay. at some point you may be asked yeah. to review to, to continue uh, studying an issue if it's that important and, and to maybe uh, say, you know what, this is not working or this is working. Yeah, we've done previous um, kind of regular reviews. There was one for the long-term operations, the biological opinions that every year there was actually a, a meeting happening mm -hmm. um, to talk about recommendations. And I think that's one example where um, if you're having more regular feedback and um, considering how to implement recommendations, that's one effective tool. But I'm going to um, think about your question and, and have a uh, have an answer prepared, or we can follow up with some examples and kind of show really the impact of some of these review recommendations and how they've actually informed decisions. And last one, I could probably ask you offline, but uh, if I have one second, uh, if you, uh, of all the things you've studied, I mean, recently we've heard a lot about uh, PFAS, the contaminate that's really so widespread. Uh, ha have you had a chance to study that at all in California? Um, none of our reviews that we've facilitated um, have necessarily addressed PFAS, but we do have some contaminants um, uh, folks sitting next to me. So I might actually see if, if Tricia um, would want to chime in on that. I'm sorry, here's something. Well, I think one thing of note, although we have not yet been asked by a requesting party for an independent peer review, the Delta Independent Science Board is actually taking, is interested in doing a contaminants review of um, what the effects of contaminants are in the Delta in the next couple of years. So that is something that is on the radar. All right. Thank you very much. Great presentation.
Yeah, thank you. Great questions. Obviously, we're all really interested in your program, and I, I really appreciated your concise um, way that you presented it. So we had lots of time at the end to ask you questions. Um, I had a feeling that that would happen, so I appreciate it. Do we have any public comment on this item? No, Madam Chair, we do not. All right. Well, again, thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to our next agenda item, which is California Department of Water Resources providing an update on ongoing activities concerning the Delta Conveyance Project. And I'll introduce Carrie Buckman, Environmental Program Manager from DWR. Welcome, Carrie. Oh, sorry. And Graham Bradner. Sorry. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Keep reading, Julie. <laughs> Executive Director, DCP Design and Construction Authority. Thank you, Thank you Chair Lee and members of the council for having us. Uh, as you mentioned, Graham Bradner is here with me this week. I, I think it's been a while since he's come to one of these presentations. So just as, as a reminder for folks, he is the executive director of the Delta Conveyance Design and Construction Authority. So he's leading the conceptual design for the process and is here today because our, our main topic is going to be the cost estimate and benefit cost analysis for the project. Uh, but before we jump in, I had just a couple of quick updates. One of them is about some recent litigation. Uh, as you may be aware, there was a recent court ruling that the geotechnical investigations described in chapter three of the Delta Conveyance Project final EIR should be considered as implementation of the covered action, the Delta Conveyance Project under the Delta Reform Act. And as a result, implementation of the covered action cannot occur until a certification of consistency with the Delta plan has been filed with you and is either not appealed or those appeals or, or the council denies the appeals through the appeals process. Uh, we disagree with this court decision, but we're still considering our options. It was just last week, so this is all really very recent. Uh, but while the, the current ruling remains in place, the geotechnical investigations described in the final EIR will be paused. And I'm guessing there are some questions from you about how this could affect the timing or our process for Delta plan consistency. And I just wanted to mention up front that we don't know yet. This is really, really recent. So just to sort of address this and, and not wait for questions later, we, we don't know. So we'll continue to work with Delta Stewardship Council staff and, and legal to try to work through that. And I think we have a presentation, if you can pull that up. Uh, I'll start with a quick slide and then hand it over to Graham. So next slide, please. So the other quick update I wanted to mention at the beginning is that, uh, you know, we've talked about this, I think, in past meetings that every year we do a, an operational spreadsheet that looks at real time data and calculates if the Delta Conveyance Project would have been in place, how would it have operated in a given year? So this year, uh, the Delta Conveyance Project would have been incredibly helpful in terms of providing flexibility during a time when we had a lot of, of regulatory requirements in the South Delta. So this year, because of the steelhead that were congregated near the South Delta, we were pretty limited in our operations. And if we had had the opportunity to divert in the North Delta instead, I, it's in a different location. It doesn't have the same kinds of requirements, and it would not have had the same kind of steelhead issues there. So we would have been able to divert an additional 941,000 acre feet of water, which is enough water to supply over 9.8 million people for a year or nearly 3.3 million households for a year. So I just wanted to flag this because this kind of flexibility, like this year is a, a year that emphasizes the flexibility. And later in the presentation, I'll be talking about the benefit cost analysis. And this kind of benefit isn't captured in that analysis because this is the, the benefit of being able to respond to unanticipated conditions. The condition this year is not one that we had anticipated. It's not reflected in our modeling and therefore it's not calculated in the benefit cost analysis. So just a, a quick intro and, and I'll hand it over to Graham for the cost estimate. Great. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, next slide, please. And just keep going to the next one would be great. So I'll start first, just summarizing what we estimated with our update. Uh, this is the Bethany Reservoir Alignment, the project selected by the department back in December of 23 for further study. Uh, this would include two new intakes in the North Delta, each capable of diverting up to 3,000 cubic feet per second. So it would be a total 6,000 CFS maximum diversion project. 
includes a conveyance tunnel, 45 miles long, 36 foot internal diameter, connecting those new intakes in the North Delta down to the existing state water project infrastructure in the South Delta. Also included would be a new pumping plant dedicated to, to not only lifting the water out of the tunnel, but also delivering it directly to the existing Bethany Reservoir through a set of aqueducts and a new discharge structure uh, separate from the existing structure associated with the bank's pumping plant. Uh, the cost estimate not only includes the direct construction costs and labor associated with delivering that specific infrastructure, but also includes land acquisition, the power supply infrastructure necessary for construction, along with consumption necessary for construction, environmental mitigation that was identified in the EIR has been included in the cost estimate. Uh, we've also included uh, set aside for community benefits program implementation, as well as a settlement agreement with Contra Costa Water District. All of those items are included in the cost estimate, and I'll show you in just a minute when we get to the summary table. Uh, we have accounted for uncertainty within the estimate in a couple of ways. Uh, first is the use of contingency, which is typical within cost estimating. Uh, we have contingency associated with both the direct construction costs, as well as the labor and other program costs. Uh, we've also used a, a different technique term risk treatment costs. And so this is through a semi-quantitative analysis of potential risks, identifying those risks, analyzing what could be done, modifications within the project to, to lessen those risks, and then quantifying those actions and including them as direct uh, contributing costs within the cost estimate. So they're not in contingency, they're actually in the direct costs that we've we've summarized. Next slide, please. So our estimate methodology, this is a very rigorous approach for, for what is a pretty early stage of development with the project. We've uh, deterministically developed uh, this estimate through an, an analysis of the schedule, identifying all of the activities associated with design and construction of the facilities, laying that out in terms of a schedule, assigning the equipment, the labor, and all the necessary resources to implement those activities, and then rolling them up by feature uh, into the into the overall estimate. So this is what's referred to as kind of a bottoms up exercise as opposed to a top down, which is pretty typical for projects at this early stage of development. We have the benefit of, of having the older 2020 cost assessment that was more of a top down exercise. And so we're able to take that estimate, escalate it to current dollars and use that as a basis for reconciliation. So we actually have two ways of approaching the estimate at this point that, that help with the confidence. Uh, overall, this classifies as a as mostly a class four estimate, according to AACE. There are some aspects of the project that would still more more better align with a class five, class, you know, association, and that's mainly within the tunnel alignment. There's a lot of uh, pretty significant data gaps along the tunnel alignment, and so that aspect aspect of the estimate would still classify as a class five. Uh, in terms of procurement, we've followed uh, a pretty conservative assumption here. We're assuming conventional design bid build procurement for delivery of all the facilities. This doesn't account for potential efficiencies and cost reductions, risk reductions associated with alternative project delivery, design build, progressive design build, those types of things. Next slide, please. So this is our overall updated program schedule. We needed to develop this not only to lay out the activities as, as I described in the previous slide, working up to the estimate, but also to provide a distribution of costs into the economic analysis so they can properly account for the cash flow as well as the stream of benefits in the economic analysis. At the top, the light blue bar permits shows completion of major permitting activities by the end of 26, uh, then major design activities in 27, 28 and beyond. Uh, under this configuration, construction would begin in the middle of 2029. That starts with the uh, early works, power connections, roads, access, the, the necessary uh, early works to begin major major activities. Uh, although we show tunnels starting around 2030, the actual beginning of tunnel excavation would be around 2033 or 34. Uh, the time needed to construct the pads and the shafts, that, that falls within the, the tunnel activity as well. Uh, around 2035 type time frame is when all four tunnel boring machines would be operational and excavating. Uh, also, the other major aspects of the project would be under construction. So that represents really the peak in terms of construction activities, uh, then tapering down to a completion, full completion by 2042. Uh, 40, 43, 44, those years would be dedicated to site restoration, uh, as well as any other rehabilitation work that's necessary for temporarily disturbed sites. Uh, startup and commissioning activities would be performed within that same window. 
uh, that would position the project ready for, for system startup and inclusion in the state water project by end of 44, beginning of 45 timeframe. Next slide, please. So this is our updated cost estimate. In 2023, real prices, uh, the, the estimate sums to the bottom. You can see the table on the right-hand side summing to 20.12 billion. Uh, the estimate breaks out in two major categories. The, the direct construction costs represent about 75% of the total estimate. So those are in the upper, uh, the upper portion of the tables, uh, upper portion of the table. The tunnel itself, tunnels and shafts, is the largest proportion of that direct construction cost. Uh, th those numbers that you see in the table do include the near 500 million in risk treatment costs that were included directly in the estimate. And then we apply the 30% contingency as indicated on the table to arrive at the, the total construction cost of about 75% of the estimate. Uh, the lower portion of the table is where what we call other program costs. Mm -hmm. And so that includes all of the labor necessary to deliver the project as well as the land acquisition. Uh, we've included the 960 million associated with implementation of the mitigation program identified in the EIR. Uh, we've also included, I mentioned the power connections, 47 million for the Contra Costa water district connections, uh, as well as 200 million set aside for community benefits program. Uh, there have been multiple reconciliations performed both within the development of this estimate. So a couple of examples would be we have our in-house design team that's responsible for the detailed bottoms up development of the construction costs. Our program management team instead used more of a top down approach uh, to develop the cost estimate in parallel. Uh, they went through a reconciliation process to resolve any differences and we we're able to to reconcile those two different approaches to less than 2%. So uh, a good reconciliation process that helps daylight differences in assumptions and, and provides for a resolution process where we can close the gap. We followed a similar approach with the development of the labor and soft costs. We also had the benefit of a, an overall master program schedule, which we've also loaded with soft costs. So we had yet a third reconciliation method that we could dial in and, and really understand how the labor costs would contribute to the overall estimate. And then, as I mentioned, we have the 2020 cost assessment that we can escalate to 2023 dollars as a very high level check on the work that's been performed. And in terms of contingency, 30% applied to the construction contingency. Uh, the other program costs vary um, largely between 15 and 30%. Anything down in that lower category that includes construction received a 30% contingency. So that's power facility construction, mitigation program construction, all the labor aspects of the estimate receive 15% contingency. Next slide, please. So here we compare the current uh, 2023 estimate with the 2020 cost assessment. So the updated estimate is inside the gold box, totaling to the bottom at 20.12 billion. So that's the first column of numbers. Adjacent to that, uh, next to the right, totaling to the bottom at 15.9 billion. That's the previous 2020 cost assessment. Uh, we then took those numbers, escalated them at a rate based on the United States Bureau of Reclamation construction cost trend indices. Uh, those indices show 26.8% inflation between the years of 2020 to 2023, and that's for construction-specific in, uh, industries. So we take that inflation index, escalate the 2020 estimate up to current 2023 dollars. We end up with a total of 20.17 billion. So very close alignment in two estimates that were developed in, in very different ways. Uh, one being just escalation of the old one, the other being a much more detailed and, and multiple reconciled process of bottoms up development. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna shift gears to the topic of innovations. So um, we, we understand and, and feel strongly that the project that's described in the environmental impact report and documented in all of our engineering documentation for that work represents a, a pretty conservative depiction of how the project would be designed and constructed. Uh, we do strongly also believe there are opportunities to reduce impacts, reduce costs, improve schedule, reduce risks. So those represent potential innovations within the project. Now, we're very early at this point, something probably on akin to maybe an aggregate 10% design level. So uh, we're careful to consider innovations at this point that we feel are highly credible and reasonable. There still are a lot of potential refinements down the road. Uh, but we don't want to lean too heavy into that at this very early stage, and we want to make sure that the innovations we're considering at this point are entirely reasonable. Mm -hmm. So we went through a process of considering ideas uh, within the design team, collecting others from outside the team, 
uh, screening those for, for a number of criteria, including compatibility, as well as sort of how viable are they within the industry at this time. We landed on a total of 19 potential innovations that, that could help minimize impacts, reduce cost, schedule, et cetera. I'm going to give you an example of one of those here on the next slide, if we could go ahead and proceed. So on the left-hand side of the slide is, is our current design. This is the, the pumping plant down in the South Delta, the new pumping plant. Uh, this, this represents what is analyzed in the EIR. It's a largely below grade structure. So at the surface, there would only be, for instance, you see the, the awning structures there to, to protect the cranes and then the gantry cranes running on rails. Everything else that you see in the image is all below ground. So this is a lot of underground construction required to, to build this facility. Uh, in the center, you see the, the uh, label rectangular concrete wet well and inlet conduit. So that's how the, the water would move from the reception shaft of the tunnel into the pumping plant. And then adjacent to the wet well are the rectangular concrete pump bays. And so that's where the 6,000 CFS of new pumps would be housed straddling the wet well. Uh, the construction for this configuration is what's called top-down construction. So this would um, include construction of a, a number of reinforced concrete walls from the surface and then internal excavation. The internal excavation has to periodically install the cross bracing and intermediate floors that allow for continued excavation under this type of design. So we started looking at an innovation on the right-hand side. This would replace the, the central concrete wet well with, with an, an extended tunnel section. So this would create essentially a header pipe that would allow water to move into the pumping plant and then be connected to the adjacent interlocking shaft pump bays. So instead of using rectangular structures with internal bracing, we're able to instead uh, replace those with a set of interlocking shafts, which are much, much, much faster to construct, much quicker to excavate, uh, saves in a number of ways. So we've identified those potential advantages in the center. Uh, first, in, with some pretty significant quantity reductions, 274,000 less yards, cubic yards of soil that's excavated for this structure, uh, 84,000 cubic yards less concrete associated with the number of reduced walls, uh, walls that are no longer needed, ground improvement that's not required, and 10,400 tons of reduced rebar associated with the reinforcement of all those uh, diaphragm walls. In total, this innovation would shorten the construction of the pumping plant by nearly 1,000 days, which has a tremendous uh, savings in terms of schedule, impact, and cost. Uh, when we rack up just the direct construction cost reduction, so that's really looking at those quantity reductions, uh, it totals nearly $140 million in terms of, of cost, uh, cost savings, and all this while really not affecting the above-ground footprint or configuration of the overall pumping plant. Next slide, please. So we take that example among the other 18, total them up, uh, and then add a proportion of the risk treatment costs. So this is looking at uh, how much are we saving with these innovations and, and, and applying just that proportion of the risk treatment costs. Uh, we then apply the contingency as a percent of construction. Uh, we calculate the labor as a percent and apply that to the, to the overall construction. Uh, you see the, the subdivider within the table of other costs. So that's land acquisition, mitigation, and, and all the other aspects of the, the estimate. We did not adjust those based on this analysis. We just focused on the construction and labor costs. Uh, and we also did not account for the potential cost benefits of risk reduction, schedule reduction. Those would take much more detailed analysis. At this point, we're keeping it very straightforward. Uh, nor did we account for potential changes in terms of contracting and delivery and how that might affect the overall cost and schedule and risk of the program. So just looking at these 19 potential design innovations, we see a real strong potential to reduce the total project cost by about one and a quarter billion or 6% of the total estimate. Uh, this is a really good indication in my mind of cost management strategies, which are successful associated with value engineering. This is going to be something that we continue to focus on in the coming years. So, uh, but I think provides a really good indication of, of the power of value engineering and what we can do to, to minimize those, the impacts that have been identified, reduce cost and schedule. So I think that is my last slide. Carrie, do you want to go straight into yeah. the so economics? Go next slide, please. And we can keep going one more. So I'm going to talk about the benefit cost analysis that accompanies the cost estimate that Graham just described. So starting with just a little bit of background, uh, the, the State Water Project serves 27 million people 
and an economy that represents $2.3 trillion, which is equivalent. If we looked at the state water project as its own country, it would be the eighth largest economy in the world. I, currently, on average, the state water project, the modeling that we've done indicates that the state water project is able to deliver about 2.56 million acre feet per year. And those deliveries go to agricultural and urban customers. And as we look forward, uh, you know, we've we've talked a lot in this group about the information that's in the EIR, which really focused on existing conditions analysis and some 2040 analysis based on CEQA and sometimes NEPA requirements. But we're looking further in the future with the economic analysis here. And when we look at 2070, uh, we look at a supply reduction in the state water project of almost a quarter. It's a really significant amount of reduction. And we also have the risk of extended disruption during seismic events. And so we're trying to capture the benefits of the Delta Conveyance Project when understanding those challenges. Uh, next slide, please. So as we looked at the project benefits, uh, we worked to quantify the benefits associated with water supply reliability and quality to offset the negative effects of the climate change on water deliveries. And we also looked at seismic reliability, that we, we were able to maintain deliveries after major seismic events. On the cost side, we used the cost estimate that Graham described and also added in O&M costs, as well as unmitigated environmental impacts. So in the EIR, we assessed environmental impacts and worked with mitigation to reduce those impacts. But there are some impacts remaining, and we assigned costs to those within the cost estimate here. Uh, all of those, the benefits and the costs, were discounted back to a net present value. That's a pretty standard economic technique to be able to compare the costs and benefits on an even playing field because the costs are incurred sooner than the benefits. The benefits are incurred further into the future and over a longer period. And the value of a benefit tomorrow is greater than the value of a benefit in 30 years, similarly on the cost side. So both were discounted to reflect present value. And with those calculations, uh, we found that the Delta Conveyance Project uh, passes the benefit cost test. We had a 2.2 benefit cost ratio. So every dollar spent yields $2.2 gained in benefits. Next slide, please. So this slide talks about the, the water supply issues. And as I mentioned earlier, we've really been looking a lot more at the 2020 and 2040 numbers. But uh, as Graham described, the construction, the, the project wouldn't be operational until 2044. So we needed to look at an economic, for the economic benefit cost analysis, a supply number that really reflected better what we're likely to encounter over the 100 years of operations. So we're looking at 2070 conditions. So right now under 2020 hydrology, without the Delta Conveyance Project, we're looking at average annual deliveries of a, a little over 2.5 thousand acre feet, or sorry, 2.5 million acre feet. Uh, with climate change and sea level rise, that decreases the yield by about 570,000 acre feet. So you can see that in that middle bar in 2070, without the Delta Conveyance Project, we are down below 2 million acre feet in terms of state water project yield. This is a really significant change to the water users that rely on the project. So with the Delta Conveyance Project, we are able to increase the reliability, not back to the amount that was that is currently provided, but closer. So we're able to increase the supplies by a little over 400,000 acre feet. Uh, next slide, please. So those increased deliveries provide benefits to the State Water Project contractors. Uh, it allows agencies to fill storage more frequently, uh, enter drought periods with higher reserves, impose fewer periods of mandatory rationing, and reduce the severity and frequency of shortages. So for urban agencies, the, the, monetiz the monetization of the benefits is calculated as the consumer's willingness to pay to avoid shortages. And that's, that's based on economic models that look at price elasticity. So those are peer reviewed economic models to develop that monetary value. Generally, the water is worth more under dry conditions than it is wet. And then for agricultural benefits, uh, we use the statewide agricultural production model, which is pretty widely used in water resources projects, as well as water market transaction data to help understand how much agencies are paying now for water. Next slide, please. 
We also looked at water quality benefits. Uh, and also we looked at water quality costs. As I mentioned earlier, when we're looking at unmitigated environmental costs, there are some water quality costs in the Delta. So we both calculated those costs and put them on the cost side of the ledger and looked at the benefits and put them on the benefit side of the ledger, the benefits to the state water project contractors. So having decreased salinity in the state water project supply does on the urban side, reduce treatment costs, improve taste, the useful life of appliances, and it also decreases the cost of water softening. In ag, it results in more efficient water use and reduces the use of irrigation water to flush salts from root zones. I will say this is a pretty small amount of the benefit calculation. Uh, the benefits are not very significant. In the EIR, we do disclose the improved water quality, but it's a pretty minor change because we aren't operating specifically to improve water quality. It, it doesn't really make a very big difference, but we did calculate those benefits and include them. Uh, next slide, please. We also included the seismic benefits of the project. So we, we're looking at the potential to avoid disruption to statewide supply during potentially significant earthquake events. So what we looked at is the Delta Flood Emergency Management Plan from DWR that was developed in 2018. And they have a, a scenario there that we modeled. And the idea is that if there is a major seismic event and it does result in failures in the Delta, we looked at how long it takes to recover and the value of having water supplies during that time. So the event included, uh, it was a 500 year event that included 50 levee breaches and 20 flooded islands. Uh, and it included a little over a 200 day shutdown completely of diversions from the South Delta, as well as um, a little over a year of very, very poor water quality. So having the alternate point of diversion would be very important during those times. Uh, when we calculated the benefit of having water during these periods, the benefits are, are very substantial. However, we then looked at the probability of that event occurring. It's a 500 year event. So the probability in any given year is pretty small. So when you actually looked at the probability as well as the benefit, this is a pretty small percent of the overall benefit included in the report as well. Next slide, please. So our, the benefit cost ratio of the main scenario in 2070 that we considered was 2.2, as I mentioned earlier, but we looked at a number of other scenarios to consider if we had different climate conditions, uh, would we affect the, the project's ability to still have a benefit cost ratio that is, is positive? You know, we're, we're concerned that if conditions change, would this, this uh, investment no longer make sense? So we looked at a variety of 2070 conditions represented on the slide as scenarios one through three, and they still had pretty similar benefit cost ratios, as, if not a little higher. Uh, we also looked at two 2040 scenarios. These are scenarios that we did as part of the EIR modeling and, and uh, we've talked about with this group before. And those are not really realistic representations for economic purposes because they're looking at hydrologic conditions before the project starts operating. So they're not likely to be representative of a, a long duration of operations, but we still wanted to get an understanding of that as well and found that they still had cost estimate or cost benefit cost ratios significantly over one. And the benefit of having this kind of sensitivity analysis is that it gives us some comfort that this benefit cost assessment is resilient, that it won't change significantly if climate conditions change from forecasts. Next slide, please. So as part of this effort, our team looked at how the cost, uh, the what they call the levelized cost. So essentially not the cost in any given year, but a long-term average, how that compares to alternate supplies. And this, this data on the slide for these alternate supplies represents projects that have already been constructed. So the Delta Conveyance Project would be about 1325 per acre foot. And that is significantly less than desalination supplies. Um, the dot represents the, the median price, and then the brackets represent other costs sort of above and below that median. So if you look at desal, uh, the, the median is a little over $3,000 per acre foot, and even the lowest cost per acre foot is, is just a little below $3,000. Uh, for recycling, we are well below the median, but but still just a little above the lower end, similar for stormwater, well below the median. Stormwater has a really, really broad range. And so it, it is uh, at the bottom end of that. And it is the Delta Conveyance Project is very similar to the average values for water conservation. 
I did want to flag here that water conservation, again, is based on past water conservation measures that have been implemented, and there are some concerns that future water conservation measures would be more expensive because a lot of the less expensive measures have already been implement implemented. Uh, next slide, please. So just to close, I wanted to mention, I think that, that we hear a lot about the cost of the project, but we also recognize that there are costs of doing nothing. Uh, if the project doesn't proceed, the state water project will continue to degrade in its supplies. A 22% reduction in 2070 represents a really serious change to the water users that depend on this supply. Uh, the direct impacts could include reduced reliability and flexibility for state water project operations, water shortages and mandatory restrictions, an ongoing risk of major seismic disruption, and the need to implement expensive alternative supplies. And so there are also indirect impacts that aren't evaluated in our benefit cost analysis, but that we know would be issues, things like higher rates for local agencies because of those more expensive alternatives, um, impacts on economic and employment activities within the state water project service area, higher food prices, and further depletion of groundwater resources because of the, the decrease in surface water supplies. So we just wanted to highlight that the, the cost of inaction doesn't mean that there is nothing expended. There is still a cost of doing nothing that exceeds the calculated project benefits. Uh, and then I think my last slide, if we go forward, is just a quick update on other permitting activities. Uh, really, everything else is sort of in progress, but I did just want to mention that, that everything is moving forward. So for the State Water Board, I think we, I mentioned during a prior visit that we did submit our petition for a change in point of diversion. Uh, again, we are not looking for an increase in our water rates just to uh, add two new points of diversion in the North Delta. And so we have uh, finished the protest period and received the protests on that petition. We have a deadline on July 12th to outline to the State Board how we are looking to try to resolve protests. And then the State Board has set our pre-hearing conference on August 13th. Uh, for CESA and ESA, both of those are underway. We've submitted our incidental take permit application to DFW and the biological assessments to the fishery agencies on the federal side. And that work is all moving forward to completion in the fall or towards the end of this year. And then on the NEPA side, the Corps is continuing to work on a final EIS that they expect out in the fall. So I think that is the end. If we want to go to the last slide, in case I forgot one. Yep, that's it. So on the left side, we do have QR codes to the more detailed reports on the benefit cost, benefit cost analysis and cost estimate if people want more details. And uh, Graham and I are happy to take questions if, if there is time. Thank you. Thank you. That was super informative. Really appreciate it. Um, I have two really, I think, quick questions, so I'll just get those out of the way. Um, on slide eight, you had a comparison of the new costs with the 2020 assessment, and I was just wondering if the 2020 costs were based on the old two-tunnel idea or the new conveyance it, it would have it was a single tunnel configuration but not quite the bethany alignment it was something more similar to the central alignment which was okay. one of the alternatives considered but we were able to kind of understand the differences and still work our way towards an apples to apples comparison thank you for that and then my second one uh was a construction question which i'm just curious about um on slide 10 when you were doing the comparison um on the innovations uh, are the circular um, innovations, are those using like a precast concrete? Is that part of the reason it's? It would actually be similar. Bo both of them would use diaphragm wall construction technology. And so that's a, a construction technique from the surface where you excavate down panels and then uh, lower into that reinforcing uh, cages to support the structure. The big difference is if you just total up the, the the square footage of those in terms of plan view, it's a much more reduced, much more efficient configuration. And because they're circular interlocking shafts, they, they have a bit more intrinsic strength. They don't require near as much internal cross bracing. So that's another big part of the cost savings that, that are required here. Uh, and then uh, with the box structure, it's not just the perimeter walls. You have to construct um, a lot more internal walls to to help with the anchoring and cross bracing. And so you save there as well. But they both use diaphragm wall construction. Thank you. Uh, members in Gali. Thank you, Julie. Uh, thank you, Graham. Thank you, Carrie, for another 
highly informative update. I had a process question. Maybe this is for Jorge too in our shop, but um, you mentioned at, at the outset that on last week's legal ruling, you guys are coordinating with our staff. I just would like to know if it's, if it's okay, a little more texture for that. How would you describe the coordination? Are there any legal limitations on coordination between your team and our team? Are you getting the coordination that you want? Do you want more or less? Or just got, I kind of like to have some texture of that if you don't mind. So I guess I can can start, and if you want to add anything, that would be great. So we we do a lot of coordination already with the staff. We have an early consultation process where we are working through a lot of our questions and and preparations for submitting our certification of consistency. Uh, we've laid out a process to to get us to a certification within the timeline that we have forecast, and and I think. Um, from my perspective, and and certainly the the staff might have a, a slightly different perspective, but I think it's been a really productive, helpful process, and I really appreciate the staff's time. I, I think I was just mentioning that that I don't have answers to the questions on litigation yet, and since I don't come back for another quarter, that might be a long time. So I think I was really just mentioning that we will we will continue to to let people know what's going on in between. Yeah, I I understood that. Thanks. I I really meant. On my coordination question specific to the legal ruling mm -hmm. we are i understood you right there is coordination happening on that right we can I, do that we are doing that and maybe that's a jorge question um i can't speak to um what staff's doing but certainly on the legal side uh, i have not yet spoken to the department but uh, i imagine i will soon and uh, mm -hmm. it, i'll be happy to discuss that uh with you dan um perhaps offline Okay, yeah, yeah I'd like to understand if there are any limitations to your legal limitations. Or... Yeah, we're still trying to figure out what we want to do. So I, I didn't mean to imply that we're already coordinating, just that we would keep people informed as we move forward. Thanks again, Carrie. Okay, okay. Member Moranian. Yes, I have one question uh, on page 10. Uh, it's a continuation of what you asked, Jir. Um, I just wanted to know the innovations are... Is there precedent? Is this done for this specific project or the effectiveness of it? Or if you could talk about that. A little. That was a big part of the screening process. You know, nothing that we've considered as potential innovation. And, and I will also note that we've documented the 19 innovations in detail as part of our cost estimating report, which mm -hmm. was on the QR code. So if there is interest from just to, to relay mm -hmm. that, uh, it's, it's out there. Um, a key part of the screening process was that the innovations considered were not on the edge of the technology, not on the edge of the industry. Uh, we didn't want to expose, you know, sort of leaning in too hard to these into some of these and then having to come back and, and really acknowledge that, well, some of them are panning out. So uh, in every step, every time we looked at a potential innovation, it was a key consideration that it's viable, it's in the industry, it's recognized, right. successful, you know, that, that, that helps right. add confidence to our process. Thank you. Sure. Do you clarify? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Member Burgess. Um, is Vice Miller? Um, she had another meeting. She had to leave. Okay, yep. I just was looking forward to her questions because she's such a economic um expert. We'll have I was to catch her up to and that. give her another opportunity. So, um, thank you for the presentation. Um, so one of the last questions I asked you the last time was related to who pays for this, and so you were telling me it's the water contractors. And um, so, you know, I'm looking at these numbers and I've seen in the other hats that I wear that things have gotten more expensive because of other things that happen, COVID, you know, all these different things that can happen. So this is really just a cost estimate and we can't even predict what could happen with other things, but um the other thing that I'm seeing is that those folks that you say are going to would be, be paying for it, they're also having to raise their rates um, because of other costs. So um, I, my, my question is, at this point, do we have a federal partner on this that we anticipate to help pay for this? So there is not a federal partner. I, I think we've probably talked about this before, but we did, really, but sometimes yeah, things just to, change. Just so to make sure yep, no changes. Uh, the CV, the Central Valley project contractors have not indicated an interest to participate. Okay. 
And um, so then that goes to um, the funding for construction and I always get in planning or design. I always forget construction and design, right? Right. So how long are you funded for? So currently we're, you're talking about what are we doing now and, and how long are we funded for? Well, I know the contractors are basically paying for what you do. And so how long are you funded for where they have to then decide if they're going to keep going? Yeah. So there, there was an original plan and allotment of funding that was provided to cover activities, planning and permitting, permitting activities through 2024. Um, we are pretty clear that we're going to be able to extend those funds at least through the end of 2025. Okay. Um, so that's what we're currently working under and then teeing up the discussions necessary with each of the agencies to consider, you know, how and and, um, and when to continue funding the, the work that we're looking forward to. I think that's going to be an indicator of, you know, how spread they are. Mm -hmm. um, so we just did, uh, we, we just saw you know, a, a presentation about structured decision making and then the independent science board. So um, will there be any outside analysis of this budget? Um, because I, I'm hearing that people have opinions and ideas that um, are not necessarily consistent with your analysis. Um. So far, I really haven't received any comments or questions regarding the validity of the estimate. Uh, we've got a couple of estimates now that we're able to reflect on. And so far, we're seeing the costs holding pretty flat once you remove the very strong effects of inflation. Um, so we're building confidence in the work that we're doing uh, with respect to the cost estimate. Uh, this is an update for the estimate that's principally necessary to inform the economic analysis and consideration. Uh, it won't be the last estimate we do. Uh, there will likely be at least another estimate prior to implementation, and that'll be reflected in some sort of new dollar basis and uh, getting everyone in position for that potential decision. Um, in, turn, uh, in terms of external peer reviews, we, we haven't engaged any any or requested any specific external peer reviews, but all of our, all of our information is available to the public. We've presented publicly at our board, uh, the DCA board. To get this information out, we've provided a number of reports and documentation out to the world, trying to keep it uh, relatively straightforward so that it's understandable. Um, so we're, we welcome input, but at this point have not solicited for external peer review of the estimate. So um, on in, in the report, it talked about, I think, 800 homes losing um, value. Is there something built into that to compensate for that and for the communities that depend on that property tax? I think you're, are you referring to the benefit cost analysis report, the Correct. economic analysis? Correct. Terry, do you want to answer that? So the benefit cost analysis, um, I think doesn't necessarily specify things like how to manage changes in property tax. I think the, the how to is a different issue. But I will say that we are statutorily obligated to engage with the counties and, and address that issue. Yeah, I think it says 14% drop in home values. So that's mm -hmm. pretty significant and for that, those communities. And that is encompassed within the cost, but the sort of how to address it is the next step. And that's something we will have to work through. Right. I mean, I look at the 200 million in community benefit, and then I look at the, the price tag, and I, I think, is that fair, you know, with so many, and I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but there are costs that are probably not identified because they're not considered significant. And, you know, I, I'm curious what all of those add up to as well. Uh, there may be, but I think we'd have to have specific examples. I think that we were trying to monetize all of the substantive unmitigated costs. Okay. And then, um, you know, when we were looking at these things, we were talking about alternatives. And one of the questions that I have, and, and you know, you can email me or share with me where that is, how much, so this is, this project is supposed to deliver what percentage of water that we're talking about, maybe 15% of the water uh, supply or something like that? Of, of what, like, what's the denominator? <laughs> well, 
uh, so the way I'm looking at it is it's supposed to be, only provide maybe 15% of the whole supply or something like that. For, for the state water project right. contractors. So that really does vary by area. And I don't have those numbers at the top of my fingers, but like in the Bay Area, I think it's about 30%. So it, it depends on the different okay. part of the state. And so the the project I'm concerned about is, are we putting money into the main water supply project? Are we upgrading and making sure? And and I I don't know. I have I, that's why I'm asking. I try to ask questions I actually know the answer to. But you know, I'm looking at this and I'm reading and representing the folks that I represent. You know. Are we spending something, a bunch of money on something that we actually should be spending money on other places? So our project has a fairly narrow range of objectives, but the state water project overall does, of course, need continued maintenance. And that is something that the state water project is working on. Uh, we have an asset management process that is underway to really make sure that we have a plan and process laid out to identify issues and maintain the project. So Agreed. This is not the only issue associated with the state water project that will need work going into the future. There are asset maintenance activities or asset management activities that will continue in parallel. I'd really, if you could send me that so that I can see what that is, I'd really appreciate it. Or... I don't think it is done yet, but oh, okay. I think we can check in and if there's interest, that's something where the state water project folks could talk about it, but I'm, I am not the expert. And I know that you talked about seismic um, concerns. It seems like there's been some more recent updated studies that um, suggest that the timeline would be different and the circumstances would be, would be different. And so are we using the newer data to determine the value related to seismic threats? So if there are studies other than the 2018 study, I'd be happy to hear it. I will say that past efforts associated with California Water Fix used a much older study, uh, the DREAM study. And of course, I'm not going to remember what that all stands for, Graham Mike, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, but okay. that was that was quite a bit older. And mm -hmm. so we didn't want to rely on that. Because right. We didn't think it was representative. So this new study was something it was done in 2018 as part of DWR's continuing effort to manage uh, seismic conditions and manage the Delta flood issues. And so we think that it's a pretty good, pretty recent representation of a potential scenario. But if there is something more recent, please let me know. Well, I know that uh, we implemented the D-list recently, and in my mind, we should have more confidence in our levy system, and and it should be less of a concern, um, ideally. So I'm I'm hoping that we are uh, definitely investing in our levy system. Um, mm -hmm. I, my biggest concern is that we're doing this whole exercise and eventually people aren't going to be able to pay for it. And uh, so my last question is, you talked about at the beginning of your presentation, how much water we would have gotten in the last, I think it was six months, right? Mm -hmm. The question is, didn't they get a bunch of rain down there as well? So that are, do we have the storage? We're talking about science changing, climate change. Do Did they have the storage now to be able to capture the water and um well that that's the question so the diversion calculation is a pretty simple amount that could have been diverted uh, some of it could have been stored in san luis the state water project storage in san luis is not full mm -hmm. uh, others could have gone to groundwater and surface water storage south of the delta i will say we did not calculate how much storage is available in those those different areas but there are quite a few so it would have gone to those areas. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? All right. Seeing none, we'll go to public comments. Do we have any public comments, Emma? Yes, Madam Chair. We have an online public comment from OSHA Missouri. You should be able to speak now. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Great. Um, OSHA Missouri commenting for local agencies of the North Delta, which is a coalition of reclamation and water districts. Um, 
have a few concerns about the presentation we heard today. Um, probably can't cover it in three minutes, so maybe I'll try to do a follow up letter. But um, I guess, first of all, I was concerned about the fact that the agenda item was so general. So we didn't really have a way in the public to understand what would be covered today. And so that makes it very difficult to submit comments. Um, so I would ask that, you know, when DWR is going to give an update or anyone's going to give an update that the general subject matter, you know, besides just Delta conveyance, because it's obviously a very huge project with very many implications. Um, so I think a little more specificity would be helpful to the public. Um, as you just heard Ms. Buckman admit, uh, their calculation of the 900,000 acre feet of quote missed, you know, uh, diversions never took into account storage. And um, she said, well, maybe there would have been storage in San Luis. I know San Luis was actually full at a point this spring. So I think in terms of uh, more useful information from DWR with respect to that and less misleading would be to actually, you know, try to model out, you know, at the time you could have pumped, could you actually put it somewhere? Um, you know, in those times of the year, especially in the winter and spring, you know, the agricultural um, demand is not high. And often, you know, the local supplies that are going into groundwater would also be, you know, quite high. So I think it's just, you know, everyone should take that number, I would say, with a grain of salt. And if DWR wants to sharpen it with some more detail around exactly how they think, you know, at least conceptually, the water could have been diverted and to somewhere in particular. I think that would be more helpful. Um, in terms of, you know, sea level rise um, assumptions in the cost, or sorry, in the benefit cost analysis, um, I don't know why it still relies on the outdated Ocean Protection Commission sea level rise information. There was a 2024 report that is more updated. And um, of course, sea level rise is something we need to plan for and be understanding of. But um, having, you know, the using like the high, high scenario is not uh, particularly informative. And I'm surprised that the cost uh, benefit analysis relied on it. Um, I definitely support uh, DWR, you know, being more explicit about how it's working on its existing infrastructure that is an alternative to the tunnel and in particular levy upgrades, but also upgrades to the conveyance and uh, pumps that it already has. I don't think those are being operated to their capacity right now. Um, so uh, those are a couple of my comments in addition. Just real quick, I'll close <laughs> is uh, I do have a concern about the closed early consultation process referred to, you know, the public's been left out of that. And um, I think that's unfair. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other public comments, Emma? No, Madam Chair, there are not. Oh, actually, yes, we have a public comment in the room. Oh, cool. Welcome. Hi, my name is Cynthia Cortez, policy analyst with Restore the Delta. I first want to say I appreciate the questions from uh, Council Member, Council Member um, Diane Burgess, um, and I hope this might answer it a little bit. I'm here to inform the Council of a report published recently by Dr. Jeff Jeffrey Michael, Director of Public Policy Programs at the University of the Pacific, challenging the financial feasibility of the Delta Conveyance Project in light of the benefit cost analysis that was released by DWR. The report finds that DWR's BCA is flawed and inflated with questionable assumptions, overvalued benefits, and a failure to consider major project risk and financial implications, and not to mention um, that the BCA omits significant environmental costs there. Um, and I would be happy to share that report with the council. Um, Thank you. Thank you for your comment. All right, Emma, anyone else? I don't think so. I think that's it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chair Lee, would it be possible to invite um, Dr. Michael to um, share his thoughts at some other time? Well, let's talk about it. Okay. All right, we're going to move on to circling back on our legislative update. Um, Jessica, did you want to give any other intro to Brandon or should I just? No, I'll just say thank you to Carrie and Graham. Thanks for coming today. Thank you very much.
And then Brandon is here to give us a very brief legislative update. Yes, I recognize I'm sitting between you all and lunch, so I'll be very quick. <laughs> um, and really quick, I would like to also just introduce Ruby Kale. She is going to be presenting with me as well later. Um, she is a fellow from the a McCarthy Fellow from the University of San Francisco, so a current student there in public policy. Uh, if I can get the next slide, please. So um, just a few quick bills I want to provide an update on. This first one, AB 174, is tied to the budget. I'll circle back to the budget here in a minute, but this is a trailer bill that is part of the entire budget package. Um, you might remember, I think it was your last month or maybe two months ago, I mentioned that there is a um, there was a trailer bill proposed by the administration to remove the sunset for the statutory exemption for restoration projects or SERP program. So this provides a CEQA exemption for ecosystem restoration pro for, for specific ex ecosystem restoration projects. Um, Council's also had presentations on two of those types of projects, both for Staten Island and the Knightson restoration project. Um, the trailer bill that was introduced as part of the budget agreement does not have a, a general removal of the sunset. It extends the sunset from 2025 to 2030. So giving it another five years to see how the program goes rather than fully removing the sunset. Um, this bill is currently going through the process and it um, will likely be passed by the end of this week. Oh, yeah. And, and I just want to add this uh, only affects restoration projects. Yes. And so the nice thing is that it streamlines projects that typically aren't controversial yeah. and do uh, and it helps lower the cost of the restoration projects that we're doing and it helps thing move things along so this is this has been really helpful um and again it doesn't it, it doesn't affect projects that would necessarily um yeah it's just restoration projects yes <laughs> Um, and then there is the tie to CEQA, which is why we've had those two projects um, come before us, because they would not have gone through the reform act process. Um, next bill is AB 1924. This one's more of just a FYI, and I think an interesting connection with Delta's place. Um, if I can get the next slide, please. Uh, this would expand Sacramento Regional Transit's sphere of influence to include the communities of Gold and Isleton, um, so providing transportation through SACRT to those two communities. This one's currently sitting on the governor's desk um, to be signed within 30, uh, 10 or 30 days, um, depending on the period right now. But uh, just an FYI that that's a nice little uh, Delta's place add to the Delta. Our next one is next slide SB 366. I've mentioned this bill a few times um, in my legislative updates. This would recast the provisions of what's required in the California Water Plan to specifically set water supply targets for the state, um, as well as various other things, setting up a stakeholder advisory committee um, and other different changes. Um, this bill was heard in the Assembly Water Plus and Wildlife Committee last this, this past Tuesday and was passed out. So now it's on to the Appropriations Committee. The committee did amend the bill. You might remember when I've mentioned this in the past that there was a reference to making sure um, but the water plan include recommendations and strategies to comply with the Delta Reform Act and the COECO goals with regards to setting water supply targets. The committee did remove these references due to potential confusion this may cause with relating the COECO goals with water supply targets. Um, so that amendment has been part of the bill, um, just to circle back on that of what I've mentioned in the past. Um, so those are the three statewide bills. I'll open it up to see if there's any other questions, if any of those. All right, and I will go on the next slide to talk about the budget deal that I'm sure most of you have heard about that happened over this past weekend. Um, the uh, governor and the legislature reached agreement on a 297 or $298 billion budget. This includes about $211 billion from the general fund. Uh, they reached various agreements on education, corrections, and health care, among other issues. And one thing I've noted is there was an agreement to work towards legislation to set aside a portion of future 
um, surpluses for rainy day reserves. You might remember that this is partly due to a, a larger surplus a couple of years ago and now coming back when that surplus didn't exactly materialize. Um, so that's uh, working on addressing that. Of note, still in the budget agreement was an eight, almost 8% 8 reduction across all departments and a vacant position sweep. Um, and we'll continue to provide updates on how that's impacted the council. And then in terms of a climate bond, still no agreement. Um, there was an original deadline of today when the climate bond would have had to have been passed to get on the elect, get on the ballot. There's agreement to extend that to July 3rd. Um, so you will, if there is going to be a climate bond, there will likely be an announcement sometime this weekend. So stay tuned to uh, SACB or CalMatters or any of the um, groups for any updates on that. Um, switching over to the federal side, uh, next slide, please. And I think a perfect example of how much more complicated the federal side of bill of legislation is in the state because of the single subject rule. Um, so an update on HR 7719, which is the Abandoned and Derelict Vessel Removal Act. The main bill is still in House Committee. It hasn't moved. But Congressman Garamendi has been hard at work finding various different avenues to get portions of this bill into other larger bills. So the federal offense of abandoning vessels has been incorporated into the Coast Guard Authorization Act, and that has passed the House and is in the Senate. The requirement for federally auctioned vessels to hold liability insurance and prove they have financial resources before purchasing the vehicle, the vessel, is in the National Defense Authorization Act. And then the most recently, and this is a big one, the U, allowing the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to remove any abandoned vessel um, and to have the owner be liable for any cost was just introduced in the last day in the Water Resources Development Act, which was just introduced into the House and is a big bill that is likely to move forward. Um, through the process. Um, it also includes a $10 million yearly appropriation of the Army Corps for this purpose. So um, some, some good movement, I think, for the bill. Um, I will also mention that there's been quite a bit of new support and co-sponsors to the bill. Congressman Thompson, Harder, and Congresswoman Matsui have all joined as co-sponsors, um, and then the Delta Protection Commission and Strategic Growth Council have also provided support for the bill. Yeah, that's what I agree. Brandon, is, is that $10 million uh, nationally or for the Delta? I'm going to guess it's nationally. I, I don't think it's a specific call. It is a very small amount for the national. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate the ability to go after owners for, for liable, liable for costs, but frankly, $10 million, we could spend that all here in the Delta, you know, this year, um, alone and still not get everything. So, um, but I'm really grateful to Congressman Garamendi for pushing on this. And I know that the more we work on it, you know, maybe we can create more money, but I'll just say, um, a lot of the owners typically are hard to go after anyway, because they typically don't, I mean, I don't know if I can say typically, but there are a lot of circumstances where the owners, can't afford to do whatever they need to do. And that's why they, they abandon them. So there's not a lot of um, money to go after. So that 10 million is really important. Yeah. And I think that's partly where the, the, the hook of the, the second part I mentioned about the, and it's a very small part, federally auctioned vessels, but at least vessels that are purchased through a federal auction have to prove that financial ability. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I will continue to provide updates on this. Um, the session ends at the end of this year and it'll start a new session of the election coming up. Um, so all of these bills have a pretty quick deadline to keep moving and get to the president's desk. Um, with that, I will go ahead and pass it over to Ruby, who has an update on a, another new bill in, in Congress that for your all's attention. Thanks. Um, hi everybody. Um, yeah, so I'll be, oh, next slide, please. Thanks. So yeah, I'll be talking about the Nutrient Eradication and Control Reauthorization Act of 2024. Um, just a little bit of review on nutrias. There's one pictured and uh, next to Josh Harder here. <laughs> um, that's actually one of the smaller ones. I would say they average a little bit larger than that. Um, yeah, so they're pretty, <laughs> maybe a little less. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, nutria are native to South America. They were brought to Louisiana in the 1880s to supplement the fur trade until the collapse of 
the fur trade in the Great Depression and then the collapse of the fur trade with um, like the rise of PETA and anti-fur kind of protests. So the population also took in Chesapeake Bay marshes in the 1940s. So we have two uh, precedents for this kind of uh, invasive species taking. Um, so they are prime candidates for invasive spe species because they are such prolific breeders. Um, yeah, so the original legislation was introduced by a Republic Congress, Republican Cong congressman from Maryland in 2003, which provided uh, financial assistance for eradication and control programs in Maryland and Louisiana. And then in 2019, an amendment was created to expand to any state in need of nutrient control and set the sunset date to 2025. And that was introduced and spearheaded by Josh Harder of the 9th Con Congressional District, so Central Valley. Um, and so he has also introduced this 2024 bill. Um, the impact of Nutria in the Delta is, um, well, Nutria are still, the popula population is still fairly low, which is a good thing. Um, which makes it even more important to stay aggressive before the population spikes and becomes entrenched as it did in Chesapeake Bay and um, the Bayou. Uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife is leading the control effort on the ground and they have, they're have they very much monitoring the nutria population, including mapping and tracking the amount of nutrias that have been trapped and taken. Um, but it's very much a Delta issue because they dwell on rivers. So um, yeah, so the risks for the Delta are very high. Nutria prevent growth because they eat so dang much <laughs> every day, um, which halts any benefits from the marshlands, which if you've been paying attention at all, we know that's so much. Um, and the marsh ecosystem naturally prevents floods and they burrow under levees. So both, both the natural and man-made uh, engineering are both at risk there. So the current legislation, there hasn't been much movement, um, but it has been introduced in the house and referred to the Committee on Natural Resources. Um, mainly it just builds on the previous bills and would renew the sunset to 2030. And we have done a really good job of trying to stay in front of it. Yes. And as we all know, with all the different things that we do, prevention is a lot less expensive than having to deal with the bigger problem of not having control over it. So this is important for us to lean in on. Yes. And we can see that from other examples across the country. Great. Any other questions for members? No? All right. Well, thank you very much for that presentation. Yes. And Appreciate thank you it. for accommodating my change of, the change of agenda. No worries. Yes. All right. And so we're on our last agenda item. Oh, par sorry. Was there any public comment on this? No, Madam Chair, there is not. Thank you. All right. Uh, our next item is our last preparation for the next council meeting we'll take and so that will take place on july 25th and we will post some meeting information about that on our website so thank you and that concludes our meeting